I call this meeting of the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District Board of Education to order. Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Coble. Ms. Pepler. Here. Mr. Register. Here. Mr. Silverman. Here. Mr. Zucker. Here. Okay. And this is a work session, but we decided to do it this way for a number of reasons um, so that we don't have our backs to folks and it will be a little bit more um, in inclusive for the, um, for the audience also because we will be taking some comments on some of the, the um, facilities portion later on in the meeting if anyone has comments to add. So... I, should I turn it over to you? Good evening, everyone. So we will first have the facilities. Deidre Gallus and the team want to come up. Who's going to start? Pat O'Brien. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Pat O'Brien with the PMC Regency Owners Representative Team. And we have three items for your review, consideration, and approval this evening. The first. I, I guess, I'm sorry, Pat. Since we, are, since we are voting on them, I should take the motion first, and then you can talk about each individually. Is that good? That is fine. Okay, okay. sorry about that. Could I take a motion? Uh, I, I'll accept a motion to approve item B1. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. okay. That's good. Uh, the first item, the, the item B1, is our final plan bid event for and GMP for the project next door. It is the landscaping, fence work, kitchen equipment, and actually there's about $3,000 worth of sprinkler work in there as well uh, to finish up, uh, again, what we had planned to do next door at Wiley. Okay, any questions or comments related Just, uh, to this item? Yeah, just what does that bring our total to now? Do you do you have that information? Total that we will spend next door is including the modular lease, all of the various components. I think we're approximately fourteen million dollars, Ron. And of course, for the 14 million, that's going to be actually for the high school and the junior highs, or for the middle school. So that that will also the building uh, will be suitable for use when we transition the middle schools in there as well. So if if one wanted to, we could view it as a three million and change per year cost, as opposed to a giant lump sum of 14 million. That would be one way to look at it. If you wanted to, yes, you could. One wanted to. Okay. Is where does this come as far as? What we were expecting is above the below. the combination of these items we had budgeted two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so we're uh, nine thousand four hundred and ninety six dollars over we had one hundred and ninety two thousand left in contingency that we're using to fund the extra nine thousand on this piece we would have been here a couple of weeks ago with this but uh, we were uh, working to get the landscape down, number down. The first price we got back on landscaping was uh, staggeringly higher than we had anticipated. Nonetheless, um, again, we, we believe this is in consistent with what we agreed in terms of landscaping for the City of University Heights. We meet the, the requirements we agreed to uh, on the permitting processes. And, you know, we're adding fences around all of our, our, uh, our ponds, and, and we believe this will have a, a very nice-looking piece of property for us next door. So when we're done with the high school and the middle school, um, reg regardless of what we do with the pro if we use it for swing space for elementary or not, these improvements will continue to be with the property going forward. Correct. Okay. So when you say the fence and that's the overflow, what do you call those little bins? Uh, uh, detention, stor uh, stormwater detention basins. Yeah. Okay. Can't have a, a stormwater detention basin that might have rain in it that somebody could potentially walk right into. Got to put a fence around it. Anything else on this? Item? Just a real quick. It, I want to highlight one word that you. I think you used. You said this is the final planned bid event. Correct. So then you should. After this, we should be able to. Okay, here's relatively. Well, we still have to do some more contingencies, but we're getting to the light at the end of the tunnel as far as the the cost for Wiley. That is correct. We, yeah, we have. There there are right. construction issues fire alarm panels, those kinds of things. But we have, again, a balance of contingencies that uh, will manage that. 
Griffin? Okay, Mr. Gaynor. Ms. Pepler? Yes. Mr. Register? Yes. Mr. Silverman? Yes. Mr. Zucker? Yes. Okay, could I have a motion to approve item B2, please? So moved. Second. Right. You second. Second. Okay, Pat, you want to talk about this one? Now, this is different. Different. This was not a planned event. Uh, we did not anticipate that we would have to make uh, safety improvements to our theater. It had been an active theater for quite a number of years. However, when we were looking at moving lights from the high school up to this theater, we also uh, did some inspections, brought in a, a, a theater rigging consultant and looked at it and um, identified some safety issues. Uh, things that operationally, as we continue to use this, uh, again, this theater for at least the next four years, uh, that they recommended that we repair and, and fix with uh, respect to the rigging, with respect to way the light bar powers up the lights, and some other minor issues associated with the theater. And that is the nature of this work. Any questions, comments about this item? Nope, Mr. Gaynor. Ms. Pepler? Yes. Mr. Register? Yes. Mr. Silverman? Yes. Mr. Zucker? Yes. And finally, for action items, can I have a motion to approve item B3? So moved. Second. This is a buying the new air handler that we are going to put on top of the Delisle building to serve the auto tech program. Um, it's approximately, it's at least an eight-week lead time, probably a 10-week lead time. Uh, as you can imagine, if you went 10 weeks from today, and then you imagine when school starts, and then we have work to do once we set that unit on the roof, we are trying to get a head start on ordering that piece of equipment so that when school starts, the auto body, uh, auto tech program will be up and running 100% with the new piece of equipment. We need a new piece of equipment because what that unit did before compared to what we have to have it do now for the functions we have in there are different and it was an older piece of equipment. So again, this gets us a head start uh, before we buy the balance of the work that we need to renovate the space where the auto tech program is going to go. Does this go where the other four big air handlers are on the flat part of the roof, or is it on one of the slope portions? It is not going to go on the slope part of the roof. Okay, so it will be in the, the middle. Flat part of the roof, yes. So we got to get one of those big cranes to... That is correct. Does this come out of the big pot of money or this, the little pot of money? This is part of the high school project. This is the big pot of money. They're all big. <laughs> <laughs> They're all big. They're all big. Where's my money? Cal? Nothing? Nothing. Okay. Mr. Gaynor? Mr. Register? Yes. Mr. Silverman? Yes. Mr. Zucker? Yes. Ms. Copeland? Or Ms. Pepler, sorry. <laughs> yes. Now well, that's we're odd. Talk <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. And now we'll move into the actual work session. Mr. Shigalas, we're ready to move into the work session. So good evening, Hello. Um, and I have Gary Baylog coming up, and Tim Thomas also. Sure. Tim, if you could come on up. Um, and Tim is uh, an engineer. Right. He's an architect, and uh, his expertise is uh, lead in sustainability issues. And John Orsini is also going to come up. Why don't we put you here? Certainly. And then uh, you can. Evan, you can just hang in there, and I'm gonna, you're going to need to talk more than I am, so I'm going to let you have the microphone. And, and Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take the presentation away. Sure. <clears throat> First of all, we're, we're real happy to be here tonight. We've, there's been a lot uh, that has happened uh, since our last work session, and um, I think we're, we're kind of on our way now, um, not that we weren't before. Uh, a few things just as an update. We, uh, last week, we met with the uh, uh, Cleveland Heights Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission has approved the site plan 
and this is the this is the this is the plan uh, that they have uh, approved. Um, I think most of you are familiar with it. That there are, are two drives that flank the east and the west side of the school, uh, parking areas, um, some pavement areas, uh, bicycle parking, uh, main uh, historic entrance, main entrance, um, <clears throat> uh, some some uh, uh, refinements to uh, the entry and exit off of Cedar, as well as uh, one of the things that uh, had. Uh, that we had discussed uh, was that uh, as, as folks uh, would come in to drop students off of Washington, uh, the uh, police department and some of the city planners thought that it would be beneficial if they would be able to, uh, to cycle back out onto Washington and go east. So we added this drive here. That was one of the things that came out of the, we had a number of, of uh, discussions uh, with the planning department. Um, we will be requesting uh, probably at least one variance, maybe two, from the planning department. The planning department, uh, the zoning code does not consider, they only consider uh, parking which is not, uh, which is off of public property as parking that is on site. The parking that we have, uh, we consider parking that is on Washington as part of our total parking package. So we have approximately the same number of parking spaces uh, on our site now as, as you currently have at the high school. However, for the purposes of the zoning ordinance, they do not consider those. And so uh, what they're telling, what, they, what they've told us is that we have fewer parking spaces than what is required by the zoning ordinance for the school. So we are requesting a variance for fewer parking spaces, and it's primarily because they cannot count these parking spaces on, on Washington as part of our total. Uh, the other variance would be probably uh, for some uh, some changes in terms of what they uh, are requiring for uh, planting and vegetation on the site. We had a meeting this afternoon uh, with the planning department again to discuss the landscape, the final landscape plan, and and uh, what they have. Uh, uh, I think what they're going to allow us to do is, is, is we will master plan the entire site uh, for uh, plantings, but for the purposes of, this, of the budget and for this project, we will be concentrating on just the area that is uh, around the high school proper and then uh, on Cedar Road uh, in front of the stadium. So since we are not really uh, uh, touching uh, these areas around Goodnor and this part of Washington and Cedar, and then, and then this area around Lee and Washington, we will we will show a, a master plan for that that can be carried out at a later date. But they're not going to require us to uh, to go ahead and and, uh, and spend dollars from this project to do that. So, you know, maybe there's someone in the community that likes really likes to plant trees, and they'll have a guideline to do that. So that's where we're at on the site. <clears throat> And uh, tonight we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, sustainability in, in the building. Um, there were several uh, high-level goals that were set for the project. Um, the the community was interested in having us uh, design a, a building that is net zero ready. Um, the the ultimate goal would be to achieve zero waste in construction and the operations of the building. Uh, another high-level goal was to uh, account for 100% of the stormwater uh, on the site. Uh, another goal was to design and operate the building for human health, and then to design and operate the building as a teaching tool. So those were the high-level goals. Um, we had a number of, of strategies that were considered, and then uh, of those strategies that were considered, some uh, were not incorporated. Uh, most of those were incorporated. And I believe that most of you have seen uh, this list that has uh, the, the uh, uh, kind of a, a, a role of those strategies and, and the status, the current status of those and the reason. And there are, um, I don't know, there are a lot. Um, <clears throat> some, of these, some of these follow. Uh, the building is scheduled to be uh, a minimum of LEED Silver certified. Uh, we think that we are currently tracking LEED Gold. Uh, obviously, uh, we would like to even do better than that. 
Uh, but again, we have uh, we have the constraints of, of the budget. Uh, there are some things which um, are because of the uh, current or the uh, original building configuration, such as uh, the the original building. The orientation of the academic uh, wings is north south instead of east west, so it's difficult to get uh, a daylighting strategy, uh, a, a true daylighting stat strategy for those areas. So there are some things that are precluded, but we are trying to get uh, as incorporate as many things as we can uh, into into that. The the key strategies that we are incorporating right now. Uh, are these and, and one, the first one is to plan for future energy opportunities and what we have done is uh, our roof structure is uh, the, the members are sized to support uh, photovoltaic arrays uh, inside the building we have pathways and uh, space for future uh, panels that would uh, accept um, uh, cabling and uh, from from any future photovoltaic displays. There's also the possibility uh, in the future, at any time in the future, for the school to purchase green power from other providers as a part of their program. So that that is more or less not part of the building infrastructure, but more a part of uh, just uh, 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 protocol or or policy on the part of the board. Uh, creating a, a, an efficient building envelope. Uh, the 1926 uh, portion of the building is obviously the most um, uh, vulnerable. And as a part of this uh, program, we are improving the exterior walls and the roof of this area, along with replacing the windows with a, a, thermally, a, a more efficient thermally broken unit. And, and a large portion of, of those building, at least on the east and west side, is being wrapped with a new um, superstructure and, and envelope. So we feel that we have uh, uh, taken care of, of that and improving. Uh, th there is a, in some cases, you know, you just can't put more and more insulation in because it reaches a point of diminishing returns where you're not really getting any more economic benefit uh, to, to increasing the, the insulation. We have a, as a base bid, we have a, a hybrid geothermal HVAC system. Uh, obviously, building controls are a very important uh, component of this, both for uh, the HVAC system and lighting. We have uh, significantly reduced the water consumption uh, that would be primarily from the fixtures that are inside the building. We are encouraging the use of alternative and public transportation. Uh, as a part, uh, fortunately, for, as a part of the uh, zoning requirements for University Heights, they encourage um, both of those, particularly uh, the use of bicycles by, in this case, by students. So we are providing uh, bicycle storage. Some of that will be covered. Uh, we are also uh, providing inside the building access to uh, areas for bicyclists, whether they're staff or students, to if they want to change or take a shower, if they ride to, ride to school or, or ride home. Uh, so <clears throat> we are encouraging that. Uh, we're also providing um, uh, preferred parking spaces for energy efficient vehicles. We're also looking at uh, potentially putting a charging station for electric vehicles in. We've reduced the hard surface area of the building by probably I'm thinking now around 10 or 15 percent for what was previously there um, so, and, and uh, along with that uh, we are um, filtering and retaining stormwater on site we had a, a, a pretty good discussion this afternoon with the city about our bioretention areas uh, we're using indigenous plants in the landscape again that is part of the, um, uh, the zoning ordinance uh, but we are we are going after lead, and in this case, uh, lead in order to get the credit. And we think it's a it's a wise move that there will be no irrigation, so we're not irrigating uh, these. The plants that we're using will not need irrigation. We're daylighting as many rooms as possible. <clears throat> we're using energy efficient light sources. Um, there's an air quality standard for the inside of the building. We're using CO2 sensors uh, as part of the system uh, to make the 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 use of, of of fresh air that comes in the building much more efficient uh, and, and, uh, and uh, introduced in the spaces that, that uh, are calling for that fresh air. 
We are using high recycled content products throughout the building. We're using regional materials that are within uh, produced or manufactured within 500 miles, so you reduce the carbon footprint because you're not spending money on transportation, uh, additional money on transportation. <clears throat> we are recycling demolition and construction waste. We are uh, currently bidding the uh, demolition portion of the building, and, is a, and, and we have quite an extensive uh, specification for uh, recycling the various types of, of demolition waste. We'll have the same thing for construction waste. And then we have been talking with uh, teaching staff and the curriculum director about developing ways to use the building as a teaching tool and uh, thinking about uh, the various areas where we might have uh, uh, some signage, graphics uh, for, uh, for instruction. Uh, the building will have a, we, we call it a um, dashboard, a dashboard uh, in the sense, but it's not, it could be a digital dash, dashboard rather than an actual dashboard because it's a little bit more uh, portable inside the building, so you're not really tied to one space. And um, there's, there's a number of ways that you could, I mean, there are, are a number of things that are just not related to the building itself, but uh, sustainable uh, living uh, could, be, could be a health class, could be English class. It's not just limited to the uh, uh, math and science department. So those are our key strategies. Um, and the list that you have kind of uh, highlights some of the specific uh, things that we're doing, but uh, they all kind of uh, fall under the umbrella of, of, of both lead and uh, sustainable design. It, from looking at the list, oh, well, first, uh, on page two or page three, what's ACM? ACM? Yes. <coughs> Asbestos containing materials. Ah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, as, well, as, you, as you're demolishing the building, this building does have right. some asbestos containing materials. So what, what they are going to do first is they're going to come in and remove those materials, uh, make sure that they are, are sent to a, 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 a specific uh, waste facility, and then, and then the rest of the building is, is open to, uh, to deconstruction or demolition and, and recycling. It would seem like from looking at the overall majority of the uh, sustainability components were, have been incorporated, it seems like the ones that, a, good, a lot of the ones that weren't, we haven't been able to seem to be uh, in regards to water, at least, at least my take is both the uh, wastewater or stormwater seems to be the only ones, or the, the lion's share, if you will, or the ones that jump out as far as a, a block of items that we, for one reason or another, we haven't been able to do. Um. The the one issue on on uh, is uh, is on rainwater harvesting and and you know we uh, we were talking a little bit this afternoon we've we've dealt with districts that have um, rural districts that that don't have uh, city water and, and and they have a building that's sprinklered so they so they need a source for they need a source for water so uh, rainwater in a storage tank is that's filtered is ideal for a sprinkling system as I said before. Uh, since there is, since we're not using plants that need irrigation, you're you're not, you don't need you don't need irrigation water. Um, the the football field is a, is our is a synthetic turf, so we're not irrigating. We're not we wouldn't be sprinkler or, or irrigating the, that field. So the only thing that's left is is uh, um, uh, the building, the uh, restroom fixtures, that kind of stuff. And uh, it there's two things. Um, Great water systems are not, uh, the, the plumbing code is a little bit, and I would say local, uh, the, uh, locally, the uh, building code, you know, they, it would require some probably um, specialized s study or, or, or engineering in order to, to uh, prove the, the uh, uh, operation of that. And the other thing is the cost, right. which was the primary reason why. We, if we looked at some of the other things that we really wanted to do in the building that had to do, and, and a lot of the focus has been on energy, um, there's, you know, on energy uh, consumption. Uh, and, and if you think back, um, uh, using, a, using a geothermal system was something that we, in, 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 back at the SD stage during the estimate, that was not that was not one of the base bid. The base bid was a conventional boiler chiller system. So we're, we have incorporated the geothermal, the hybrid geothermal, as the base bid, and because of that, there was a premium that was set for that. So we, we had to make some choices, and, and so it seemed to make a logical choice. As far as the other storm water, 
Um, we are providing for like a 10 year, I think, event. Um, if you, there is a, there is on the drawings um, a, uh, an, al an, alter an alternate, which we, well, I'm going to call it an alternate for right now, but there is a, there, there is a design for, for, for storage on site. Again, that is, you know, if, if that ever gets incorporated, it's a, it's a cost issue uh, rather than anything else. The, the, then the question becomes what to use that for because the storage is one thing, but the running, uh, if you have a gray water system, you, you have to run, I'm thinking you have to run uh, an additional set of water lines. So you're doubling the number of, of, of plumbing lines that you're running in the building. If, if I could add or a question to that, Gary, you, you did, uh, I think you explained um, that we won't have as the irrigation needs, but you didn't talk about the baseball and softball fields once those are completed and, and returned to the original use. There is a, There will be a need there. So could be. Yes. Um, I, I'm sure that we do currently, Steve, do we currently we use a sprinkler on those occasionally? We do. We do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Okay. It's just I, something to consider. I understand there's a cost to everything, but, I, I, but there, well, you there know, isn't I, that need at, at other parts of the... Yeah, I, I will say this, that as designers, we're an advocate for all of those. Uh, it, 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 at some point, it becomes a, um, a choice between what, what is probably more beneficial. Yeah, um, I understand. And, and so, you know, love to do it all. Another item, uh, right now, the uh, LED lighting. I know, I think right now is a, we're looking at breaking that into at least one or two different components just for, for an alternate, a build alternate, correct? I'm thinking that right now we're anticipating that we will have a majority of, a uh, majority of the fixtures in the building will be, will be LED with no alternate. Okay. That's great. Does, does this, um, what you've done now brings us into budget? Is, are we in budget? Steve, do we know yet? Um, we're still, still working, working on, it. <laughs> on that process right now. Um, we've had some preliminary conversations with Gilbane. Their DD budget is due next week, their full DD right. budget. We had some early conversations with them uh, today about portions of the budget. And in that conversation, um, it, um, Gary mentioned that we've now discovered that we are able to get the majority of the LED lighting into the uh, base bid. But uh, um, so we're still working to uh, to get to our to our budget so would there be opportunities to interact on this at all in terms of what's in and what's out what's alternate what's an alternate and what's not um there there could be yes yes there could be that opportunity for the uh, board I mean, to have that discussion yeah i think it would be worthwhile I th you know okay. the, the at least the briefings that we've had i think we ought to plan on doing another round yeah we we mentioned to dr dixon uh this afternoon that um it it's our recommendation that we push back uh the approval the board approval for the design development uh phase to the may 19th date and that would give us the board meeting coming up to have some additional dialogue about um uh, the alternates and what's in and what's out um, at that meeting. At, so, at the May 4th meeting. At the May 4th meeting, right. Well, the, the May 19th meeting is about strategic planning. Yeah, and I um, think we're at the, and uh, is that the high school? Is that the one where we're recognizing the 10 year Yeah. A pretty crowded so, agenda. Yeah. I don't know how, I mean, they're all crowded these yeah. days. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but I, 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 um, I think Ron, certainly, you know, we're not taking action on, on any of these, what the board approves for, um, the bid, um, or for the alternates, you know, at this point. So there's always additional opportunity to interact on this and knowing that Gilbane hasn't, we don't have the numbers from them yet. Right. And that those are I mean, we will come. We have to come in on budget, obviously. Right. But the alternates become the um, the important factor in that. 
the meeting of the 19th if it's a at, is it the high school and what's uh, you know i honestly don't remember where the meeting the the we, work session is we on the 19th we proposed it for the social room because okay. of the, the recognition, recognition of teachers and so that's usually a a, a fairly good good uh, crowd and that's the only large space we have available right, right now well, i was just going to suggest why not move the recognitions to six instead of seven just yeah we can talk about yeah, that we don't have to talk about yeah. that now but yeah okay eric did you have other um, comments no just at the uh at the leds it is that was i know previously we we're looking at as a potential alternate but then that's going to be a on the base bid um, no i was just to me it it, it it struck me is that the overwhelming majority of these we were able to incorporate or we may be able to do later on and then the, the at least the one the the, the lion's share that jumped out were the, the water issues which obviously as you're saying because of the, the I, I i want eric to, <laughs> i want eric to say a little bit of something about evan 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 <laughs> eric evan. i want evan to, to say a little bit of something about um what we're trying to do is in terms of the water use to re and to really reduce water use there's there's two things you can there's two things you can do you can um you can you can catch more water okay or you can use less water i mean there's you know it's it's like if, if you have a budget problem you can either raise more money or you can spend less so it's the same it's kind of the same principle so yeah, just to expand on what Gary was saying with the rainwater capture, not it's more than just capturing it and storing it. You have to treat it. So essentially think of it as a small wastewater treatment plant that you'd have in your mechanical room, and it would be a smaller version that would not treat it to a drinking level level of cleanness, but it, but a, a level safe to put in the piping system and flush toilets and urinals with. So if there is a significant cost if we wanted to use it for like a cistern and then use it for watering of the fields is would, you don't have to do, do you have to treat it for that or just you just have to you have to filter it because okay. there's going to be some grit and things that are okay. in there from the roof and and that'll plug up the sprinkler head nozzles if you can okay. think, well, picture that only because i'm thinking uh with right now the east fields while we water them they, those get really beat up so we don't treat them the same way you would perhaps a, a true practice field or a, a true baseball or softball outfield. So I could see if we're no longer using it, it's no longer getting beat, beat up, I could see us theoretically watering it more than we have in the past. And if we can use our own water, then, you know, that'd be great. A little bit about those fixtures. Yes. Um, I, I pulled the, uh, the drawings out and I was looking at at the fixtures that we're currently using on the project that are in the design. Um, a, a standard water closet would use 1.6 gallons per flush, which would be like what you'd have in your home typically. Um, a low flow fixture would would be 1.28 gallons per flush, and that's that's what what's the norm as far as a low flow fixture that that's out there. Recently, there's been some, some new developments by uh, Zern. They now make a 1.1 gallon per flush. And we want to incorporate those on this project because we feel that from what we've researched, it's a good product and it performs as well and even better than some of the, their competitors in the 1.28s. So when we, when we go to a low flow fixture like that, we can really reduce the overall water consumption even beyond what we consider good. So on a, on a school like this, um, for lead purposes, we need, to, we need to reduce water consumption below the baseline by 20% to meet the lead prerequisite, okay? So that you get no points, no credit for a 20% reduction. So if we can get down to 30% reduction, we achieve two points. Right now, with uh, using these low flow water closets and then also uh, sensor faucets where we slightly reduce the cycle time at which the water comes out of the faucet, uh, we can further reduce uh, consumption. And when we add all that up, uh, right now we are just over a 45% reduction. So on a school, traditionally, 30% would be great to achieve that. 
we are at 45. That is, I mean, I, I'll, I don't want to be flashy, but we're on like kind of the bleeding edge of, of water reduction. <laughs> And still, and still using, and still using responsible products. I mean, we could go waterless urinals, but there's a lot of maintenance issues with that. We don't want to sign up the school for long-term problems. So we want to be careful with the type of fixtures that we specify. You know, keeping maintenance in mind for long-term. So, so the 1.1 1 .1 is a 45 percent reduction. That and, and the combination of the other. Well, that that. In, yeah, that contributes to the reduction and also the, the faucets. So, so the other thing is, is, you know, it's water in and water out, too. So the amount of water that's going into your, the amount of wastewater that's leaving your building is reduced also because you're not sending as much out. So, and that was, I think, one of the, one of the goals was to try and reduce that amount. Um, just, just uh, one, one thing. I just, I, you did say it, Evan or Eric, if you prefer. Um, <laughs> uh, the cold words. <laughs> um, um, you did say it. But I want to be clear. I, first of all, I, I think you guys have done a real nice job of trying to be very conscious of all these different things. I think you've been very creative, and you've you've done a real nice job of incorporating about a bunch of different things. But it is really important to to be sure. And you mentioned it is the performance has to be there too, because because. We all know that when the low flow, and I don't want to get into graphics here, but when the low flows first came out, they didn't work well at all. Absolutely. Uh, um, and, and so that's changed, and, and a lot of them work very well. And the 1.1s, I, I haven't seen them, so I don't know. But I mean, just we just do want to make sure yeah. they work well because they, it does cause other problems that, that can ultimately cause more energy consumption in different ways. So, so just something to yeah. we can just let that rest. Well, <laughs> I, I'll just add, I'll add one more thing because I think this is worth mentioning. These these 1.1 1 .1 gallon fixtures, um, they've recently been installed at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, mm. and they're used as a national case study for the manufacturer. Great. So they're they're installed locally, and and my understanding is they love them. Great. Great. So that's a tough use facility. So well, as, as long as we do our due diligence on it. Um, the other thing is, I, and I'm just actually responding to something I heard in a, another meeting I was in. I'm, I'm glad to hear we're, we're trying to get in and do the, uh, uh, the LED lighting. I, it's, it's really robust and lasts forever, et cetera, et cetera. But many people are under the wrong uh, impression. Um, I think most of the people that I spoke to said, well, it's no big deal. You know, you just put LED bulbs in these and it'll be fine. And I'd like someone who has even more expertise than me, which doesn't take a whole lot, but um, it, it, to speak to that, because it, it is a difference in fixture, correct? Yeah, yeah. It, it's also the it's it's the it's the. Um, I say the parabolics of the, yeah, the, of the, the quality fixture. of the light and the distribution of the light. It's, mm -hmm. it's the different. color of the light. Yeah. They, they, they've come a long long way. Right. It's, it's, that's one Can of you come up toward the mic a little? little? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of those products like Evan ta talking about the, the the toilets improving. LED lighting has come to a point where it is the it, the premium option and cost wise is coming down and even at a premium price the cost savings is so great and so immediate it's it, as far as far as the priorities of things to go for go for that one right now right so, so two different things here and, and and you brought up the second thing I was going to bring up but first is I think people know in their homes now you know you can get special bulbs that replace your incandescent bulb and change to a different lighting that isn't what we're talking about here we're talking about different fixtures it does not require different wiring correct right so the wiring is the same but it does require different fixtures and that's why it's a it's a it's a discuss a bigger discussion than just let's just replace the bulb sometime the, the spacing on the fixtures is also different so you just can't you just can't say here's a layout for um, some other conventional kind of fluorescent fixtures and then we're just going to change them out to to it, it changes because you because the distribution is different right right and and then the second thing which you brought up uh, is is the, there's quality of light, so many people in their home prefer the quality of an incandescent bulb. It's a softer, warmer, warmer look. Uh, fluorescent, many people don't like. Talk to, talk to us about the in, uh, uh, LED lighting in terms of in, in educational settings. Is, is it considered a, a good light level? Uh, um, um, the, the, there again, the, the, the improvement of these lights fixtures is just great over the, the, the years. The uh, distribution 
uh, lack of glare is is a, a huge factor. So, so it, and the the, the color, I, I guess, I, I think people sometimes have problems with the color because they're they're used to these and and used to being in bad color rendition. The, the color is actually very pleasant and, and white and soft. I think another misconception is people are also used to bright spots and and, and they, they they like to see this and not used to this even soft light it is it is really remarkable the the the, the difference and they're uh, boy it, 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 the more you look into it the more it just becomes a no brainer it, it, it's a wonderful solution now there's in part we I'm gonna move we this. really think it's a good idea um, I just can't see you. Can mention it's, it's better lighting it, without the energy benefit. The, the, there's, besides the energy uh, benefit, the um, the longevity, when you think of the cost of, of let's say, a, a gymnasium space or some other space, the, uh, the cost for uh, staff to relamp those on a yearly or bi-yearly or two-year basis, um, it's really, it, you know, if you don't have to replace a... a, a, a uh, a, a bulb in a fixture for I don't know six, seven six or seven <laughs> years. It, you know, there's yeah. a sa there's a savings in staff also time. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's just like in your home. It hurts when you have to pay uh, you know twenty five dollars for a light bulb, but it, it feels much better when ten years later and you're moving out and you haven't changed it. Other it, questions on this part on the. Okay. Sure. Sure. I'll let you go, John. That's it. Go ahead. So we are uh, now getting into the part where we're presenting uh, exterior elevations. We know that uh, the elevation we see is uh, has been seen a lot, and what what happened over the last um, two months was really the architecture of the building envelope of the outside started to really uh, come into form and shape. You know, we've had many meetings associated with this. Not only have we met with uh, with the board and the district, but we also met with with our um, our CM also in regards to the elevations that you see, so that. What we're talking about is is relative to not only the architecture but also the budget of the of the project. So as we see here, that's you know that's basically cedar. It's the restoration of the tower and the architecture associated with this. And just so everybody remembers, we were trying to be really diligent about maintaining that certain architectural style that was um, that was built in 1926 along not only Cedar, but when we start to wrap the building along uh, Goodner and on the stadium side. Uh, we, what we have here is uh, the student entry to the building. This is located on the east side, and this is the um, drive that goes from Washington to Cedar, and this is where the current uh, baseball fields sit. So we can start to see the relationship between um, window openings and entry and how with the entry you can start to see within the building. And just so everybody's aware, this is the uh, main east-west corridor. And it's the, in the same location as the current east-west corridor. So when you enter here, there's still that memory that you always have about Cleveland Heights High. You enter into the space, you go to the center, that's where the auditorium is, and then you proceed along to the north. Um, the architecture does start to get modified at this point. Um, we start to look at uh, new educational wings, which is this right here. But we tried to maintain scale and integrity of existing openings from the 1926 portion to the newer, uh, to the newer elements of the building. So you can see relationship of openings, basically a, a, uh, a five window opening. You have, you have a window, then a little bit of space, and then the three windows, very similar to what we see here. In regards to the replication, you know, we maintained, we were able to maintain the wraps and the scale of windows and what's in between windows. We felt that that was really important in regards to the architecture. And a lot of these lines are starting to carry out through the building. Rather than, than doing a banding, um, the lines are, 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 are there, you can see them. There are certain elements, and it's hard to see 
sometimes in, in the renderings of this scale, but there are certain elements that do continue to wrap. There's a, uh, there's a limestone band uh, about two and a half feet above the their first floor on what we call the cedar level, and you will always see that appearing throughout the building. So even though you can't see it here, there is, uh, there is an art articulation and a detailing of brick that's maintained. And that's the same thing with, with this element that you see there. That's one thing that becomes consistent throughout the project. So you could go to the next slide. Um, we start to see here um, what we call the dining commons and the media center, and then the academic wing. And, you, and here you start to see the relationship between scale and openings from the new wing to the existing architecture that was rebuilt. In regards to, uh, in regards to the student, student commons or, or you know, cafeteria, you start to see the articulation of light. And what you're seeing here, you can sort of see it right there, is you're able to see into the building, right, which was really important in regards to Cleveland Heights because uh, when you're inside the building right now, it's, if you're not inside a classroom, it's, it's hard to see out. Even your, current, um, even your current cafeteria, the windows are at the one end, the, the space is sort of long and narrow. So it was, really a, um, it was really important to start to introduce natural light into the building. As you come to the north here, this starts to become um, kitchen and service. You know, once again, natural light plays a real key role here because when you're inside the serving space, we were able to provide windows to be able to not only to see out, but allow, you know, the people in the kitchen that are working there all day to have natural light coming into that space. So this space can become really active in regards to students during, um, during the course of the day as they wait for parents or guardians to pick them up and uh, just to hang out before a baseball game. So we thought that that was uh, sort of key. As we move towards the north, uh, once again, you start to see the same architecture and the same rhythm. You know, we work diligently trying to maintain a certain vocabulary of architecture so that as you, as you come from the, the uh, south side of the building to the north, it looks like one cohesive project. Once again, we start to see this idea of, of, uh, of opening for gymnasium. Over here, this is the auxiliary gym, and for the natatorium. What you don't see here is the articulation of detailing that's going on. So you have that band that's continued here. You have, you have memory of, of that other, um, of, of the window spacings where you had, the, uh, you had the double hung and then you had the transom above. So that's always, always sort of there on the first floor. When we start to come over to the athletic side, um, we started to look at uh, how we tying this in not only to the original architecture, but also to the, to the field that's here. Um, we see the natatorium space. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is another entry that goes back not only to the PE portion, but also to music and CTE. Um, and then we see the, the main gymnasium. And we talked about um, providing maybe potentially graphics along, along the first floor of the Washington level. And it, it just happened to work out um, that we were able to fit the word heights in there. So it became really relevant, and we thank Nancy for that. Um, she, she noticed that in one of the, uh, when she was reviewing the renderings. Once again, we see the, the repetition of the architecture. So everything, much like 1926, even though the architecture is different, the idea of repetition of rhythm is always there. In regards to materials, you know, we tried to keep the palette very simple. Um, as we can see, in, uh, in the original building, and this is actually an addition, but it's, it's a replication of the existing architecture. You know, the original building has, has um, stone. We're trying, to maintain, um, we're trying to maintain that color in the new portion of the building with a block, a masonry, masonry product that is similar in color, if not matching in color. So that there's always that memory of, even when you see the tower, in the front, you see that color. You see the texture of the stone or the texture of the block. Um, and then the other material that's been introduced, for the most part, it's introduced at elements above the, the floor that, that or above the level of the site that you're on. And that is a, uh, that's a metal product. Um, and uh, that we're still 
in discussions about color and all that kind of stuff, and this isn't the time to do that, to discuss that. Um, but there, there are options for color, whether, uh, whether it's um, a different tone of, of something that's on the building or if it's a completely different product. Um, what, what the next steps are right now in regards to the exterior elevation is, is we had a good direction. We had some good meetings last week with the board um, about direction. And Gary, if you go back to the entry one, about two or three slides, yeah. We're starting to take the architecture here and we're looking at not only um, the, the, um, this in regards to detailing what happens inside, but also, you know, the main entry. We're working on, um, you know, re re, re, um, we're looking at the, the balustrade that used to be there, the entry doors and that kind of stuff. So each time you see these things, articulation and detail becomes more uh, developed. So that's, that's sort of the next step. So if we go, we have a couple interior renderings um, that we want to talk about. And this, um, there were some minor changes to the cafeteria, not much. We still have clear story and exposed structure. So the space is high, natural light's able to come in. Um, we can see the scale of the space. It's, it's, um, it's, it's wider than the current uh, cafeteria, but it's about as deep as it. So, so for those of you, you could sort of get a sense of how big that space is. So multiply the, um, the width of the student, of the cafeteria right now by almost two. So it's pretty wide space. So, and then we started to look at the media center. And the media center is adjacent to the library and we have a volume that separates the two. Um, the media center, as you can see, you see the articulation of, of this wall, this educational wall and this educational wing coming inside. Um, and you can see the stacks filling the reading room. It's a, it's a tall reading room, very reminiscent of, of some of the historic libraries that we have. Um, so that's, um, that's what we're doing. And, and just so everybody knows, you know, what we're doing on the outside with development, we're also doing on the inside. So our next step is to take these kind of renderings and these kinds of spaces and develop them, study, you know, is this window right? Is the articulation of lighting right? Um, you know, we, we've met with the librarians and um, we talked about placement of books. So um, that's the next step. And this it's the same thing with corridors, you know, finishes and, and that kind of stuff. That's, uh, that's what's happening next. The, the you know, these, the, the renderings that you see here, <clears throat> to produce one of those, it, it takes yeah. uh, just to load it. Uh, you know, everybody thinks, well, you just kind of hit a button and it does it, um, but it doesn't do that. So um, to, to, to come from this step, you know, we would we do a number of these just kind of as studies before we go to the full-blown digital. We, we thought that we were far enough along on this uh, to, to, to produce something like this uh, because we think that the you know the, the the volumes the shapes and for the most part the fenestration uh, is set so we're, we're really just talking about some of the details now but uh, as John said that same process will happen with all of the interior spaces and I think um, there are going to be a number of very dynamic spaces besides the, the student commons uh, the media center um, the music spaces the obviously the the uh, gymnasiums and um, the natatorium yeah uh, the auditorium. Yeah, and even uh, the entries. You know, when entry, you so. when you enter this building, we were able to provide a um, a three story space. So there there's that. And then uh, one of the existing spaces that's being renovated is it was the cafeteria when it opened up in 1926, and then it became the library. Now it's freshman experience, and its new life will be the art department. So that space will be um, respectful of the existing architecture that's there and the existing vaults that's there. And it's really perfect for a sort of studio space because those spaces can share not only views but um, volume. Mr. Silverman. <laughs> uh, I, I go, I'll go, so I'll go first. Um, if we can go back to the site plan. A little too far back. 
Plant. Plant. Oh, yeah, you got to go all the way to the beginning. Oh, that was all the going. Going. Oh, right. That's right. Next yeah. one up. Um, I mentioned to the folks last uh, last week um, a couple things. I think in the courtyard, the site plan I think is working real well. Uh, would be when we the images that we use for the campaign included that uh, cross the sidewalk from the east door to the west door. Right. Uh, right there. Um, if we could bring that back, because talked, I think talked about that yeah, today. Yeah, we okay. did. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. We're working uh, on that. And then I think it would be very useful also is the and we spoke last week, the design details for the front portico, uh, because that's going to be. Uh, I think symmetry is always important. Yeah, and, so. and and yeah, symmetry and beauty is really important, as you know. And and uh, you know, I talked to you a little bit about it on Sunday. So the picture actually really helped us, and Tim Tim's actually working on on that a lot. So we we're incorporating not only the existing architecture, but how how that ramp works right. into that. Okay. So we were looking today. We think that the flagpole that is there now, right, is right there. Yep. So uh, we're the question we had was we, we wondered if that was the historic flagpole because it shows up in all the. The one from 60, no, that's, oh, that's no. we're looking at the one, the 26 one would have been farther back as well, so that's right in the middle of Science okay. Way right now. so th there's no significance to that one. No, just, the, it, it's a replication of what was originally there, but. It might yeah. stay. Exactly. Yeah. It might stay. Um, I think the other, next, I guess, go to uh, the front elevation, well, we've, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to suggest that we stick to this view if anybody else has a comment on, on, sure. on this, oh, okay. that's all. Okay. Anybody else? Well, the only question I have is the traffic on the um, west side of the building. That's one way traffic, isn't it? Yeah, that's one way, and it, it it's is, it is no one, turnaround. It is one way from Cedar. There is a gate right here, so you pull in from Cedar, and and, and this this is important because the the uh, uh, the bus for the special needs students would would pull up over here. They would come inside, right inside this entrance here, and there is an elevator right there that takes them up to their classroom spaces. So, so this is one way right here, but it is two ways here. You just can't drive out onto Cedar. You can, you can pull in off of Washington and park in here and go back out, but you can't exit onto Cedar. It's not really, and it's so not. You could park all the way up here. Yes. 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 And then just turn, and you could turn just around back, and go back go out. Back, you just back out and you go out. There would be a, there'd be a sign here that would say no exit. No exit. And that's unrealistic. That's not a public. I mean, it's not really a public drive. It's more for. It's I think going northbound. It's purely for our, our district vehicles and going to be primarily buses. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So you can go either way when you get back to Washington. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this view? Okay, go ahead, Eric. And the next one, uh, the uh, exterior uh, front per perspective. On this one, um, I believe the stonework around the east and west doors, I believe you, it's been... Uh, yeah, that, that's been changed, okay. um, and we're in the process of updating this rendering also. Then the, the one question I would pose is, I know on the, on the east and west facades of the wraps, we're going with the masonry instead of the stonework. Um, these two ends here, are we going with stone or are we going with masonry? We, we, made, a, we made an executive decision that it, it seems to be better to make it consistent with the wrap. So we're going to, we're going to replicate the, 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 band. the banding, but it will, be, it will be with a brick masonry okay. of a different color rather than the stone. Now, but then when it faces the interior of the courtyard, is it going to... There is only one. Are there how any many, wind, how many yeah, windows that, are on that side? No, it's it's very similar to that. Yeah. So so now the the, the entirety of the wraps then will be the uh, would, would brick be, product would versus be brick masonry. Okay. There's also you know we talked about how does we we when <clears throat> when you remove the science wing um, the you can't see I guess it would be is it that end there. Yes, that end yeah. that end of the bill we don't know to the extent of the damage of right. the brick so what we're thinking is we would salvage brick to use to patch in here so that that face is whole but what we're thinking about is that right here between the new wrap and there that we would put what we call a it would be kind of a reveal that would maybe be yeah. out of it the out, out of the out of the brick, and it would be similar to the corners that are on the existing building. How you have the the, the mason, or excuse me, the the stone that's there, 
So it would be it would be sort of a memory of that. It would be a transition. And what it does is is you have because of the way they built 1926, brick coursing is done a little differently right. than it is today. So that's why it really Never. became important as to how we handle that. And we thought it was better to separate it to have the new bricks. Right. Well, yeah. All right. The new brick. You oh, don't right. Want the new brick hitting the old coursing because so it gonna, might be just a little bit off. It'll be off. So you have a vertical element of stone yes. that'll that way it'll be a buffer between. That way you won't have two different eras of brick. Right. Next right. Okay. right. Yeah. You'll notice the color right. difference right. and the coursing difference. And we the thought that will was be different a, too. That was a good um, move. The but the, 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 the I guess my point being is that the the windows on well you can see it on the left side. Yeah. The windows that face into the courtyard on the wrap and then facing Cedar Road. That's not going to be stone. That's going to be the masonry product we're using on the rest of the wrap. That's correct. So, so if I'm standing in a courtyard, it'll be pretty obvious that this is 26 and this is... Yeah. Okay. And when can we expect a solution to the elevation issue on the west staircase, the west door? Because it's got the... Oh, yeah, that's... Uh, you know what, Eric? I could probably send you something okay. on that. Yeah. When, when, we, when we modified the stairs, we corrected that. Okay, cool. Yeah. It actually worked out really well because you exit, and that also includes not only elevation, but it also includes grading and site drainage. Right. Because it, if everybody remembers, the whole site slopes from the um, what I'll call the northeast corner of the courtyard to the southwest corner of the courtyard, the existing grade. So, and we looked at existing drawings also to see what sort of happened there. Now, will the stonework we see here on the for the door is that going to be more similar to what we're seeing on the east, the main entrance on the east side? Yes. Okay. So it'll be more more squared off. It's as more I, squared I, off, yeah. As I said, it was uh, '30s Italian fascist more. Yes. Okay. The the scale, yeah. Yes. Okay. Or the Lakewood Library, if you will. Yeah. Anything else on this? Just a. Um, there's a a little thing in the back of my head that keeps bugging at me but we got the Clark Tower and do we think of the Clark Tower at this point in the same way that you were thinking about some of those interior pieces or have you have you figured out how you're going to restore that or what you're going to do with that in terms of materials and things like that the the way we are the, the way it is being currently priced is that um, they are, uh, the contractor is tasked with examining it and replacing those pieces which are damaged and then refurbishing, you know, painting uh, the, uh, the remaining pieces. There, there, are some, uh, there are some items up there that, um, that are deteriorated beyond repair so it's replacement. However, there are some things which are in, just in, in sore need of, of, uh, of uh, stripping or sanding or, or whatever you do to it in, 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 a, in, a, in a coat of some uh, much better, much higher quality paint. However, um, I think there is an option that if there is the, an opportunity to replace some of those moldings with a similar profile with a synthetic product, mm -hmm. Uh, that that is also an option. However, uh, currently it's priced as, as kind of, I'm going to say, a restoration of what is there. Okay. Well, that leads to my more general question. When we think about what you're doing and you're thinking about being on budget, off budget, over budget, under budget, are you thinking that there is a standard relative to square footage and linear feet and you use that as a basis and then you start figuring out the materials after that? No, they, they are, <clears throat> our, our documents are based on best practice and design uh, and, and the intent. The estimate, this estimate, the DD estimate, is not just based on a square footage. It's based on a quantities and a takeoff of actual material and construction. So this, this estimate is actually much more important than the SD estimate. Okay. Well, one last question on what we're here. The the the, the four primary, uh, the two 1925 stone medallions, and then the two that are behind the building on the North Pool. Have we? Where are we on finding a place to reuse those into the new structure? You know what, Eric? We were looking potentially at this. This potentially could be a location 
as well as on the other side of this element right here. Because I know, are those the ones that are um, near the original pool, pool of the building? Yeah. Yeah. The two would be on the two are on the north pool, and the other two yeah. are above the science wing, where you can only really see them uh, okay. if you're on the roof of the science wing. Okay. Four. Yeah. So, so we have, you know, we can potentially do all four on cedar. Right. Which yes. Yeah. So, and Ex then it relates to the the right. you know it's in the brick. That, exactly. Right. Except we'd have to change it from the 1920. We'd have to change the number to. Well, then we have a new one to put on somewhere. 2015 or, or 17 or something. Okay. Um, no, if, you go, if you go to the east door or the main entrance, um, the only thing, and this is going a couple slides going forward, is that I think, and this is a email I sent to when I saw the images today, um, we the 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 paneling looks all smooth. But, yeah. but there's going to be, there's definitely, there's a level of detail, even even the stonework, there's a level of detail, I think, in our current images that it looks like it's one giant panel where, in fact, there's a lot of detail right. that when, shows. Yeah, and, and, you know, when you actually start to look at these, and we printed them out in our office, you can see the detailing of, of the metal panels. But you're right. right. The detailing's not showing up here as much as as um, as some other images that we have seen. Is the, 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 the hand sketches. sketches you, the hand yeah. sketches, it was like, wow, okay, you get, there's a, it doesn't look like a, a spaceship where it's smooth, whereas right. these, it's like, well, this is a much more yeah, no, uh, it, modern looking than well, what it, we were it, looking before. If, if you recall, we had, we had one session where, and this was a work session maybe f three or four sessions ago, where it, the images appeared to be too, to have too much uh, heavy line weights yeah. and, and and it was the, the those were distracting. So these, you know, are a combination of you know they 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 take a digital file from our from our Revit and then they they start to apply a uh, a pattern or or a tone over it. So th there is some layering that goes on, but the detail, the, the same detail that was on the sketches in terms of joint pattern and that kind of stuff yeah. is there. It's just it's not showing up in the. Yeah. And, and I imagine yeah. if. if if this were modeled with a different uh, daylighting exposure, that you would probably get a different shadow on it that would show it up more, too. Because, you know, if you remember in our meetings, we talked about shadow, right? right. We talked about how we pulled the entrance out, um, not a lot, just to provide, in regards to this elevation, entry being proud of the wall, right? right? So there's always that, that line of shadow there. And the, uh, also, you mentioned I put in the paneling. While whereas we're making a commitment to the paneling in this location, we still have uh, a fair amount of time to determine the exact uh, color that we're going to go with. Correct. That's correct. And and what we had talked about doing was providing a mock-up panel. And the mock-up panel, let's just say we would build this right here, right, so that you can see not only the relationship of metal to masonry, but also between this detailing that's going on on the masonry. And then from where Steve sits, it also gives us the ability to see how the wall's constructed, to see how, how water goes from, um, as we know, walls have the ability to weep. So it shows the construction of the wall also. So it's really a positive thing. My one concern about well, a light color masonry as well as the panels is just that the, when the, the sills drip, is that just how you know, how soon is it going to appear, and then you get these? You yeah, know, and that, yeah. that's one of the reasons why we don't um, that that we're not using a um, a split face product because it really shows the dirt. And then so, the and what happens with this system? The, the beauty of this system is that um, it's so um, proven that there's there's drips and um, flashings over here that will bring the water from this face away from the building. So any any masonry product that we use, uh, we specify a dry block system, which is a it's an integral um, part of the of the of the mix of the product and of the mortar, which um, I'm going to say re repels repels water re repels water. So what it does is is the water is the carrier of the of any kind of 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 uh, dirt that would stain. So what that does is it, it, it basically um, keeps the building a lot cleaner in terms of those so kinds of the, I do like you mentioned that the, 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 you have a three-story 
uh, almost yeah. an atrium, which was sort of one of the things in the sustainability. Um, as I mentioned, I think if we could put some sort of like an Oculus or skylight at the top right. of the inside, I think that'd be great because that would give us a lot of natural light and make that a real nice, uh, when people come yeah. in, give that a real great wow factor. Anything else on this? Nope. I, okay. Um, the next one, I guess, if you cycle through, would be to the. That's the, the cafeteria. Yeah. And then, of course, the cafeteria and library, that facade around the windows, that is a uh, masonry product, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, we basically, like I said, there's basically um, in this, which you see here besides the brick here, there's really only two products, okay. which makes it really nice because you don't have a, a, you don't have a hodgepodge of different different elements. I mean, I'm not, as, as we know, I'm not a big fan of the panels. I prefer all masonry. Right. But the flip side is, is that it's not like the whole, it, it's really more of just in certain sections and even on that, the, the north facing facade above this to the third floor, so be it. Yeah, I, yeah and, and you you know that, yeah. that we worked hard on trying to get the masonry here right. and it's it's not it's only a, a matter of, of architecture but it's a matter of, of really the whole project in right. general, right. which includes economy yeah. of of not only cost but economy of material and what's available and that kind of stuff. The east facade showing the natatorium entrance. Uh, next one please. The only the only thing I have on this son, I'm not comfortable with the paneling at ground level next oh, right to the here. Side. Yeah that section. Yeah we're looking at okay. that. That's yeah we, we are looking at that um, <laughs> only because we really don't want people to be able to touch no. it. That's exactly right. And, and that's the reason why we're looking at that. Because we had um, talked previously about yeah. having all masonry at ground level. Yeah, Sorry. Okay. and that's where it came down. So so we'll, we're, 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 it'll probably become more of a, um, more of the buff product. So th that would be, I mean, that's it for most of my other questions really, since we now have, if we're, move, we're not, if we're moving from the 4th to the 19th, other questions I had, which are detailed stuff we can probably go over in the next few weeks. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. So is the plan to take public comment on this now, I think? And then, um, so would anyone, again, just for people who aren't used to coming to our meetings, we don't typically take public comment at the work sessions, but we've committed to doing that related to these facilities presentations. So if anyone would like to make public comment, we don't ask people to sign up for these in advance. It's a reaction to what you've seen and heard. So if you'd like to make public comment, please um, come forward. Hi, Alan. I'll remind him. And Alan, you're an old pro, but you know the drill. Five minutes and we'll give you fair warning. Uh, again, I'll keep it short. There's a whole ton of things I could talk about, but in, in the lighting, there's a control system. And so you talked about the fixtures themselves, but the control is another part of the energy savings. I, I didn't hear the, the project talk about that, but I know last summer, last August, they were talking about it. And so it, addressing that, and uh, maybe the other thing I really ought to ask is, is expected energy use intensity for the building at this point. There's some discussion or some suggestion that that's gotten better than it was at the schematic design last September, but I've been unable to get numbers to, to know what it is. And that's a performance thing. Much of this discussion was qualitative. You know, there really are numbers behind, you know, the building's got a model, and, and that means there's expected performance on the building. So hearing some of that would be good. Thank you. Can anyone answer Alan's question quickly on that? Or or maybe at the next meeting? Okay. So that wasn't brought, but Alan, we will make sure that that's a question that we answer at the next meeting. Anyone else? Don, are you headed up? No. No? No? Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. So next we will have Bob Swaggart. If you would come up, please. We have our first reading of the math curriculum adoption series for grades 6 through 12. And for it, it would be two readings, and we'll do the second reading on May 4th. Okay. 
Bobby, you can go to the podium if you want, or you can sit either either way. <laughs> I think I'll, you I'll can stand sit next for... to Gary. It's all right. Or, like... No, it's okay. Gary looks flummoxed. <laughs> Where's Evan? I want to sit next to Evan or Eric. <laughs> uh, good evening. How are you guys tonight? Good, thanks. Uh, I am here to uh, present some of the work that we've been engaged in for our mathematics uh, curriculum adoption. Um, I've provided the board members with some information that outlines the plan that we've been implementing um, over the last year and a half, uh, but I wanted to highlight some of those points um, and then really present the board with a recommendation for adoption of materials. <clears throat> uh, to begin, all of this work has begun out of our district leadership team. Um, the process began um, last year with a pretty comprehensive needs assessment of where we are in the district. Um, out of that, we created uh, a math subcommittee. Uh, we had a reading goal, a math goal, and a climate goal. Um, the math subcommittee was born out of the DLT work, and ultimately the math pilot uh, was born out of that work as well. Uh, we use district policy uh, in order to execute our evaluation of pilot materials, uh, and we also were in compliance with um, district policy on looking at multiple vendors, the process that we use to um, select those potential vendors. Uh, and we really engage lots of our stakeholders, specifically at the building level with middle school and high school teachers in uh, piloting these materials, uh, getting our administrator staff feedback. And we also uh, looked at some components of student data, uh, achievement data. We looked at feedback from parents and students that were involved in the pilot, uh, lots of data to look at teacher perception and feedback all throughout our process, ultimately leading to a recommendation from the Mass Subcommittee for adoption. Uh, additionally, the district leadership team was updated monthly of our pilot progress, uh, just to keep them abreast as to what's happening, uh, to make sure that we were on target and that we were fulfilling the goals of the Math Subcommittee. Um, who was involved, again, I talked a little bit about the teachers and administration, um, but if you use some of your materials, and I'll kind of walk through some of those important pieces, and if people have questions, then we can have a little bit of a dialogue. Uh, there is, in, on page one, the background. It gives a little bit of the timeline. In the winter of 2014, a curriculum review plan was approved by the CHUH district leadership team. Funding was allocated to purchase new math materials. Uh, in the spring of 2014, a math review committee was established to begin the process, keeping in mind the budget allocation and the needs to keep the curriculum review cycle. So really thinking about um, it was beyond time for us to look at adoption of curriculum materials for mathematics. Uh, we're really trying to make sure that we um, adhere to a schedule that we are created for all of our different subject areas. So I think part of the responsibility of the new administration that has come into play in our district is to create that cycle and make sure that we are updating our curriculum materials materials um, to align with new state standards. Um, the charge given to the sub math subcommittee was to evaluate published criteria that meet or exceed CHUH expectations for secondary math instruction. Using a standardized rubric, the committee will summarize feedback from teachers, students, and parents. Some of those uh, points of feedback are summarized in the packet that you have under the last page under conclusions. Um, so I can definitely bring that to your attention as we kind of work our way through the packet. Um, the committee chose a piloted program in the spring of 2014. Uh, we really narrowed that from a list of probably 10 vendors down to two vendors, thinking about um, the two were, that were chosen were Big Ideas Math and Carnegie Learning Math programs. Um, we wanted to make sure that we gave due diligence to um, piloting those two math programs, but also partner that with the fact that we had seriously lacked um, math resources that were aligned to new state standards at our middle school. So we essentially piloted one middle school had Carnegie Learning, the other middle school had Big Ideas Math. Uh, the professional development was geared towards those buildings in order to execute the pilot uh, proficiently. And then we compared some of our achievement data. We did not compare student data directly. We looked at where students came in, what was their pre-assessment data, where did they come out, making maybe a little bit of the assumption thinking that the the result of that was based on the program that they were using at that building. Uh, so that's kind of how we uh, disaggregated some student data. Um, 
I'll draw your attention to, um, let's see, I believe it's page four, where it talks about frequently asked questions. Uh, this is really um, kind of the nitty gritty about the math program and what we were implementing, um, how the programs were selected. Uh, number three talks about what schools and grades will be in the pilot. So again, we piloted materials at Monticello Middle School. They were, used the big ideas math. Roxborough Middle School used the Carnegie Learning, and then the Cleveland Heights High School um, really used the Big Ideas Math for our general education um, math programs for algebra, geometry, and algebra two. Um, those are really the, the major courses that were involved in this pilot, and a lot of that is based on publishers really don't have materials that are consistent that extend up past algebra two. As we start getting into pre-calculus, we start getting into calculus, it's really, um, it's not as consistent as a series might be that usually we have to go looking for some individual materials. Talks a little bit about how the programs were selected and the data that was used. If you move to the page that is uh, labeled page number six, you can see the results. This is really the, the first five pages were the proposal and the plan. Uh, page six and beyond are more about conclusions and recommendations. Uh, in March 2015, the math subcommittee recommended or reconvened to analyze student data, teacher, parent, and student survey data, and to evaluate the math pilot program based on the criteria outlined in the CHUH board policy uh, 2510. The committee looked for trends and consistencies in the survey data and completed a comprehensive review of our Carnegie Learning and our Big Ideas math pilots. Below is a summary of how each program scored on the six components of the textbook evaluation rubric, as well as the cost comparisons between the two programs just for consideration. Uh, the six different components include learning goals and objectives, content, assessment, teacher support materials, physical characteristics, and support materials. So you can see how the ratings specifically for those two programs um, played out. It was on a, really I guess it would be more of a five or a six point scale for four being at the desired level of quality, and then minus four or SD meaning serious deficiency, and it should be eliminated from consideration. So that was just consistent with our board policies of 2510. Overall, the total from our math pilot was that Big Ideas scored a 109.5 rating and the Carnegie Learning Math Program scored a 92.5 rating. And I summarized those so you can see subtotals uh, in each category as well as the overall total. Uh, the page that are listed as page nine and page 10, uh, really talk about the student achievement. In order to draw some comparisons between the math program materials, we looked at the increased achievement demonstrated through map testing. We are not interested in comparing the overall performance of students on the map assessment, but rather we're interested in looking at the amount of growth each student demonstrated between map administrations. And you can see a little bit that talks about uh, overall trend data and where we are versus uh, norms as, as other schools districts who implement the map, but you also can see there in, I believe it's green, uh, based on the, the program, the, the growth that our students made uh, in their respective buildings. Uh, page 10 includes that information uh, for our high school. And so overall, we see that there was uh, a significant growth from our students' um, fall map administration. You can see the amount of growth versus the fall to winter 14-15. Um, page 11 really talks a little bit about our math pilot cost comparison. Um, that is information that was current as of 3-30-2015. We're currently working with our publisher to, or our publishers to make sure that we've got um, the accurate amount of textbooks that we need because we did purchase some pilot materials that they are going to credit us and we don't need to repurchase those. So a lot of it is making sure that we do an inventory right now on teacher materials, student materials, resource materials to make sure that we are, are consistent with what our actual needs are. So when you look at the, big, the Larson's Big Ideas proposal, and those costs, they're probably going to be a little bit lower because of what we've already applied um, and during the pilot program. And that leads us to the conclusions. Uh, if you take a look on page 12, um, Initially, I would like to state that both of these math programs, both Carnegie Learning and Big Ideas Math, were chosen uh, as a pilot because of their alignment to Common Core State Standards. And actually, those programs were created 
four Common Core standards, not realign two Common Core standards. Both programs scored high marks in content, and all middle school teachers valued the resources provided with a consistent math program. Roxborough uh, implemented Carnegie Learning, uh, but was unable to use the companion adaptive software program called Mathia because it was not currently compatible with our technology at, those school, at the middle school. Um, it is important to note that research studies conducted by Carnegie Learning indicated that the highest student achievement take place when students experience three days of classroom instruction with Carnegie Learning and two days of students working at their own pace through the Mathia software. Teachers on the math subcommittee had serious reservation about having the needed technology to implement the companion software, and additionally, teachers expressed concern over implementing the three-day classroom, two-day online suggested structure of Carnegie Learning. Big Ideas has an online component that provides access to the core instructional materials, as well as online support and additional resources for students, parents, and teachers. These online components can be accessed through any internet-abled device. Both math programs meet or exceed most of the criteria for Dex textbook adoption, but ultimately Big Ideas Math with a score of 109.5 was rated higher by the math subcommittee as compared to the Carnegie Learning, which was 92.5. The math subcommittee tracks student academic progress through the measurements of academic progress assessment. The trend data shows that even though students were below the national norm scores for MAP, the CHUH students had increased achievement between the fall 2004 and winter 2015 MAP math administrations. Based on the outcomes of the math pilot, the subcommittee recommends adopting Larson's Big Idea math program to serve as the board-adopted core instructional tool for um, general education. This adoption of math materials will serve students in grades 6 through Algebra 2 for the next six years and will include a textbook, student resource materials, online access, and all necessary teacher materials. I don't believe we need to take action for the nope. first reading, but nope. what questions or comments do uh, you have? Page nine, which shows us the student achievement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I guess what do these numbers mean? Sure. I, as I'm looking at, I, it's what's the, what's the scale? What's good? What's I? You know, the only thing I noticed was that if if I'm reading this correctly, I guess uh, first and foremost, what's the scale? I mean, it's from. It's 208, for example, sixth grade, fall MAP, 208.7 out of what? So it, it's a score that scales up each year. So what you really can look at is the amount of growth that is expected for a student. Um, and that ranges from our sixth grade, which really is around a four-point growth from that um, initial score. So if you see the fall map norm of 219.6, or .6, like ultimately, if you think about a year's worth of growth from there, or growth from there it would be around four points for students in a sixth grade. Uh, when you start to move up through the eighth graders into high school, that gap narrows narrows a little bit where we look at an a, a expected amount of growth would be somewhere around a two point, maybe a little bit more well, than a two point. No, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm viewing it more as a, as a civilian who's, okay, I'm familiar with, you know, like a, a one to ten, one to a hundred, or a one out of five. I'm, I guess my question is... What does 219 yeah, mean? Yeah, what's 219 mean? I, I don't know what that means. I, mean, it, as, I guess my question is, what's the scale? And then I have a, another question. Sure. <laughs> No, that's a difficult yeah. thing to answer. Because the, the way it's designed, yeah, I just, I'm actually going to probably defer to, to Ms. Bird, but the way that the map is designed, it's not as easy as to yeah, put to, to A, B, C, D, E, F, or, you know, or zero to, there's, there are different scale scores, and, and you, you described it accurately in, in terms of, you know, you should see bigger, larger numbers of growth in the lower grades, and, and it goes, um, you don't expect as much. It, it does narrow, but I don't know, Miss Bird, if you want to, is there anything that we can Let's, simplify this? It, it's yeah. It's a it's a valid question. It's just a difficult one to, to kind of answer. I mean, I trust you. I just it's, I'm trying. <laughs> uh, for, no, but as a civilian looking at as a yeah. civilian looks at this, it, it's just numbers on a on a spreadsheet. It's, what's They've it both said it very well, um, and the it looks like I believe these are the national norms that are provided. So MAP uses what's called a RIT scale or a RIT score to identify student performance, and it is, it's specific to that test. So what I can provide to you is um, the, the worksheet with all of the norming information on it so that you can see the typical performance for a student in seventh grade is 
225 at the beginning of the year. Typical performance for a student in the seventh grade in the middle of the year is, a, is an average score of 221.3. So when you're looking at the numbers here in that chart, that's what that means, but it's hard to to, to say without looking at my reference sheet that right. that means that they fall into the 75th percentile, but there is that percentile comparison. I just don't have them memorized. This, so, so theoretically then, 219.6 is a percentile, but... 219.6 is a scale score. Scale so like when score. we think about, um, if we compare it to the OAA or the OGT, the students receive a scale score where, profi where 400 is proficient. Okay. Um, and then, so you know there are scores uh, above that that'll get you an, an advanced or an accelerated measurement or limited or, or basic. So when you're thinking about this, the numbers that you see under the, the fall and winter map norms are like your, your proficient or your expected performance level. Okay. Then I, if I'm, I'm extrapolating out, I guess, if uh, I'm a senior, is, uh, theoretically would there be a, if, I'm, if you each year you're supposed to be getting a little bit higher and better, is there like a max, like a senior would be theoretically 250? I'm, I'm just. There is a, um, NWEA doesn't even, pro they don't provide norms for a student in the 12th grade. They go up through the 11th grade. And yes, there are uh, performance measures fall, winter, and spring for students in the 11th grade. So theoretically then if I wanted to, I could, the I could view the, the 219.6 is the sixth grader spot. It's like a, on a longitudinal scale. At the end is say 250, and this is working my way on yes. that scale. Okay, yes. that, that, I, that I can wrap my head around. Then if I'm looking at this here then, what you're saying then is that when we compare Monticello versus Roxborough on the system um, at the, I'm sorry, uh, Big Ideas had big gains at Monticello in the seventh grade. Carnegie had good nut gains in the eighth grade. I'm sorry, in the, in the sixth grade, and both of them were pretty much, as far as, pretty much were equal. So in, if I'm looking at the, on the right column, each one of them did pretty better than the other, and then on the third metric, the third, they all were, they were pretty much the same. I'm so. still seeing between, I don't know what you mean. I don't, I don't, from, from you spring of 2013-14 to the fall, I see greater improvements or greater growth with the Big Ideas group in grade seven and grade eight than I do for the Carnegie Learning Group. And then I see the same thing in the difference from the fall to the winter. I'm, I'm using the column that says fall to winter 14, 15. Right. The sixth grade, uh, Carnegie did better. The seventh grade, uh, Big Ideas did oh, looking better. At the, the, okay, I see what you're looking at, And yes. then the eighth grade, 4.8 versus 4.3. So it's pretty much almost. It's comparable there. Right, okay. Then, so I'm reading that right. Okay, then my question ends up being, the next question would be, on the page 11 math cost comparisons, okay. uh, when we're talking professional development, how many people are we talking about? So at this point in time, we would be talking about everybody uh, six through Algebra two in our district at both middle schools and our high schools. So I mean, we really are talking about, um, you know, probably 35 to 40 people. Well, I would, I would, I, I would anticipate we would see a higher participation for this than we do for our traditional in-service day. Are you talking about percentage of attendance? Attendance, yes. <laughs> so, first of all, I know that our teachers are. Um, very excited to get moving with this program and in order to implement the program they would need professional development so even the ones that have already started i think that we've been working with the people who are um, delivering the professional development that a component of that is around unit design um, not just about here we're going to tell you how to use our program so and then normally also to add to that these are normally special sessions mm -hmm. and not included in the right. professional development day. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that work happens even yes. during the summertime yes. that you get those days in and then or the vendor may come in on a special session to throughout the school year to provide that. Definitely. We'll this, we, we probably would do some follow-up on a professional development day for the district, but this would be outside of that. Right. And Thank you. But, Eric, can I follow up oh, on sure. that? Because yeah. the, the, But these are, these are direct expenses for the professional development so for purchasing that professional development from either the vendors but the the, the indirect the cost to sub hiring substitutes to cover those would be higher for the one because it's it requires a larger number of those days right but, but that's why 
usually it happens in the summer. More time. So you don't have that sub okay. cost. Okay. Now there may be some teacher cost to that to pay them to attend, but usually this happens in the summer because you te you're helping teachers get ready yeah, to implement yeah. in, in, yeah. in the fall. Okay. Yeah. So wait, I'm I'm we we have to pay folks to attend training. Is that what I'm hearing? Right, yes. because it's outside of the regular contract. Okay, I just yeah. I just yep. want to make sure that I'm hearing that correctly. Okay. Yep. Um, and the, so basically, the, the, the Larson's big idea is, is $317,000 is the cost. And if I understand, because it's $10,000 in freight, that obviously means we're buying a lot of books, correct? There are a lot of books that come along with this. And my last question would be, and I don't want to sound like some Alta Cocker Luddite, but um, what are the tech? It's textbook. What, 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 please explain the technology component sure. of what, you know, I, I'm. It's a book, I got paper, I got pencil, I got a whiteboard. Explain the technology component, please. Sure. So um, if you just go to the top of page 11 where it says Larson's Big Idea, you can also see that it's not just a textbook. It includes a student edition work text, a basic skills handbook, um, six to eight, and a six-year digital resource. So we are using a bundled um, purchase where it is the, the actual resource text, but it's also all of these components are, are um, available to our students and to our families online as well. So it really is about giving multiple tools. Um, I know that sometimes districts talk about, well, we only want to go to technology, but then we're kind of stuck without in case technology fails. This is actually a blended solution where it is going to give our students uh, complete online access. The teacher might even be able to determine, well, I'm going to send this textbook home, um, so it becomes a resource there, or I keep a class set here, but we might uh, implement the use of our technology based on what is available at that level. Um, so it really is a blended solution that um, if a student is struggling with a specific word problem, some of the resources include being able to click on a video link that will walk them through an example um, specific to their, their question. So it really is about trying to, to bridge that gap so we're not always relating or waiting for a teacher to come around and offer that immediate support that some of this is students could be working in small groups, they could watch the video tutorial, um, they have the smart board software so that could even be a learning station in the classroom. Um, there are a lot of integrated technology tools um, with our adoption. Those are all my questions. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I would just like to say I've seen a lot of these processes, so kudos to Ed Services Department. Yeah. You did a very thorough job. Um, you were very thoughtful in the process. You followed board policy. Um, you <laughs> I had, like to do that. You know, you had a <laughs> lot of input from um, various stakeholders. Um, and to do the pilots and to have that data. So when you're talking about data driven, you've taken your data and really made an informed decision. And, um, and most importantly, it, it, it aligns with Common Core standards. So when you talk about teachers working on their, their standards and their curriculum with their teaching, this is a great supplement to have to that. Um, so kudos to the team for your process. Very thorough. Great. I did have a couple of questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sorry, a couple of questions real quickly. Um, and, and some of this is going to be answered with the pilot, but I do want to ask, uh, in terms of building buy-in, because we've all been around long enough that we've seen a lot of math programs come through, especially, it seems like math programs get a lot of whining associated with them. So, so uh, um, what, tell me about how you feel this the process has built buy-in in the staff. That's great. Um, so I think because of the scale of our pilot, it really has already started to help build that buy-in. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, our middle school teachers were pretty much happy to have anything that was consistent um, and that was going to help them achieve the standard. So, you know, I think that we've got really positive results out of both of our middle school pilots. I think that they implemented it um, with fidelity. I think that they were very thoughtful about how we were going to try and use this because they knew that, wow, we have we don't have real strong materials that are going to help um, our students learn these really complex math concepts. Now we do. Let's not waste them. Let's really use this as an opportunity to build our knowledge, to build our students' knowledge. So I think that even in the pilot, we had a lot of buy-in. Um, it was a large pilot. I'm not, I'm not going to lie that this was um, you know, a lot of dollars that were spent up front not so money that we'll have to do now that we're going through um, with a, a formal adoption, but because we really wanted to see what would work best for our staff, what would build that buy-in. Um, and it, it was tough. It was tough for our 
committee to even make this decision to say we want to go forward with one instead of the other. The biggest issue around some of the Carnegie Learning was the, the, the subcommittee talking about which one would be easier for us to implement fully as prescribed right now. And, and I, we had a lot of discussion around, you know, Carnegie Learning is a quality math program. Um, it, it does a tremendous job of helping students scaffold their learning. If they have ga gaps in their learning, great. But I think that the challenge became, and it would create buy-in. Like, that's where it really started to say, like, maybe our teachers aren't quite ready for, you know, giving up two days of instruction um, to a computer program. And that's where we really had to say, you know, if we go ahead and say, yes, we're going to move forward with Carnegie Learning, but teachers aren't going to have that buy-in, then are we wasting a resource? Uh, we really wanted this to be the primary core instructional tool for our district. We know that a lot of times we move outside of this and we start getting into supplemental materials. We really want this to be a high-quality uh, tool that we say this this is the thing that we use. Um, it's not going to say we don't need additional tools or supplements, but there are a lot of things within this program that say keep referring back to our core instructional program. Okay, so, so then I have a couple of questions I'll just cluster into a into one so that in the interest of time. Um, so in terms of collecting the, the overall scores, the biggest, the largest area of discrepancy actually is in the physical characteristics mm -hmm. category, which is I guess interesting to me because I would consider that one of the lesser important categories, in my opinion, that's just my personal opinion. Going forward, the, the, in the conclusions, when you mentioned that Roxboro was unable to implement because the iPad, um, and Roxboro did the Carnegie. Yes. And so uh, I guess I need to understand, do you feel that that skewed the data in a meaningful way? It's a, it's a good question. I think it came up during our math pilot as well. Um, there are those two components from Carnegie Learning. And again, Carnegie Learning says to implement and get the best results, um, use both. But at the same time, they still have a, a textbook only version of this. Um, Carnegie Learning is really quickly trying to develop a native language for all of their materials. Um, and even when we were talking to them a year and a half ago, we had talked about the tentative release of these materials. Can we jump in on a pilot? Can we um, get access to some of your online materials? Can we pilot this with you? Can we be part of your case study? Um, and kept coming back, well, yes, you can. You just need to now pay us to do that. And we're like, well, we're, we want to pay you for some materials, but we're not we, we want to be part of a beta because we want it for our teachers. Great. And they came back and said, well, we'll let one of your teachers be in the beta. Like, again, that wasn't, it wasn't working for us. And so, again, we keep coming into this cycle. Like, I know they're going to do great, amazing things with their software. It is an amazing tool. But they keep, they're not able to deliver that component to us. So we have to move on. No, I appreciate that. And, and I mean, for those who aren't seeing this, the, the cost for the blended version of Carnegie versus the big ideas is actually 45 to 50 percent greater uh, total cost. Um, but the, the so, so help me with one thing that we talked about in strategic planning, but we've talked about for years. One of the big complaints with, in education in general is the lack of consistency or lack of, uh, of a, a solution that lasts. Now, you mentioned this is for the next five or six years? Doug? Six years six subscription. Years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you're, you, you, this study's done on one year of data. Uh, tell me, I mean, you've been around a long time, so, and, and, and your, people on your committee have been around a long time. What gives you the extra confidence that this is a, that whichever program we choose uh, will be one that can really withstand the test of all the pressures of oh, but there's another thing coming down the pike sure. again. How do we how do we keep this 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 focus and and st get something and stick with it? Well, one of the things that the subcommittee did before we even started looking at vendors was we created a uh, a checklist or a rubric of things that mattered most to us. And one of the things that really boiled up to the top was a consistent math program. So as kids transition from five to six or transition from grades eight to nine, that there were I think sometimes we assess the student's ability to transition between programs instead of thinking about, I'm, I'm measuring your math, right? It's the same math, but it's like, well, we ask it a little bit of a different way. So we've specifically looked at that, and um, Math Expressions does align with the Big Ideas math program. Um, almost, well, 
they come from the same publisher. So one of the things that we're looking at is even trying to eliminate those transition gaps in math learning. Um, so that's one of the things. Our staff is now being able to come together as 6 through 12. I think we're even going to be able to have some of these conversations um, K through 12 as we talk about successful implementation of math standards as we move along. That's a, that was a really big thing. What does it look like to have consistency of program? Um, the second thing is there, as Big Ideas um, updates any of their online software, it is immediately available to us. So as they start to see, you know what, we need more performance-based assessments. Uh, we need to update our bank of online assessments. That is immediately released to us through our subscription. So we are not waiting for, okay, well now in six years we'll have to go ahead and get a new uh, version of this. So it really can be responsive to um, the change in you know, fixes in content or if standards change or they move some standards around as they redefine some of the courses. No matter what path um, standards boards take or National Council of Mathematics uh, Teachers, whether they do, I think that the online component allows us to get immediate releases from the publisher. Um, the, the other thing about this is um, even though this is um, pushed out to us through um, Hooft and Mifflin, Larson's big idea is a company that designs math textbooks. This is not someone who is saying, like, we dabble in science, we have English, we have social studies, you can get all of your solutions from us. They are a math publisher. And so that means that they have people who understand what the math learning looks like, what math standards look like. They're up to date with um, the, the national organizations for math. And so it really is something that we're, we're getting a quality partner because they know what's going on um, with high quality instruction in math. And I think that that was one of the other components that we were really looking for that could help us get through any implementation gaps or anything that says, well, standards may change a little bit. Um, they're going to really help us through that. That's, that's, a, that's actually a good answer. It, um, thank, thank you. you. But, um, but I, I didn't say that with any surprise, by the way. <laughs> no, that was your usual good answer. Um, so, um, the, so one final comment and one final question, then I'll let us move on. Uh, the, the comment is just, it would, I would hope also, in terms of making a more robust solution, that there's a feedback loop mm -hmm. from their customers that they actually listen to and respond to. Because as, the, as you said, if you've got access to the changes, it would be nice if some of the changes are based on feedback from the customers. But that, that's not in your uh, corner. But, but I, will, I will address that. So even as we were going through this, um, one of the teachers, um, actually Mr. Klein, who was sitting on the math subcommittee, he said, so how responsive are they? And he emailed them during our subcommittee review. And um, before we even moved on to our next agenda item, which was probably about 10 minutes, he got a response from uh, the company. So I think that it was, Good. he was testing it out. So he may have <laughs> talked to you already about that. Um, and then the final thing is, that you talk about teacher support materials. Do either of these or do any of these provide parent support materials? Do so it's a great question. So one of the survey questions that we asked parents was, how comfortable do you feel offering support? Uh, and where do you go to get that support um, for your child? And the, the data was really interesting because a lot of parents responded, um, I don't know how to help right. uh, my yeah, son or right. daughter, or um, they're frustrated in math and I don't know where to help them or how to help them. So one of the components that we're really looking at, and it was available during our pilot, but I think that we didn't necessarily market it out to parents because, again, I don't even know if we were familiar with all of the bells and whistles that are available. But with that online textbook, um, parents can go in and it does link to Khan Academy videos. Videos. So parents could, you know, watch those with students and be able to help out. And that's not saying, okay, you need to go to this different site and search this word. It's already embedded in there. Um, some of those video tutorials are going to help parents at least know what it is that, you know, big picture, what am I trying to help you accomplish instead of just saying, well, I don't know how to do that. So I think that there is this embedded component. I think that the, as the district, we're also looking to decide what additional supports can we offer and put out there for parents to complement this. But I think that, again, we want to stay within our core program. I mean, we're, we're spending a lot. We really want to make sure that this is a tool that everybody can use. And I think that we want to build that language of math literacy for both our students and our parents. This is where parents go when they need help. This is how you access it. This is what you do. Even if parents can help students understand, this is the question that you ask when you go back into your classroom, that's a, that's a win. Um, so students can really get clear on what they're learning. So I think we want to 
um, complement that with our own district resources and make those available to parents as well. And, and while I don't want to commit resources that I'm not in charge of, although it's much more fun, um, the, the, in, the, in days gone by, the, for instance, the PTAs would get involved with providing uh, uh, sessions that were tutorials for parents for, exa for new programs. And so maybe some of our volunteer groups would be willing to try and lend a hand. So anyway, I'm done. Thanks That's for great. letting me thank indulge you. me. All right, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, I need to take a very quick break. Yes. Not a, it doesn't have to be an official five minute break, but, so we can just but go ahead and transition while you guys are coming up. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. So I think we kind of take a segue from what um, and Bob's work when we were talking about the um, curriculum, mm -hmm. and then how do we assess students and and knowing that they're doing that they're mastering the curriculum that is being provided and being taught to them by their teachers. Um, so for this next s segment, we wanted to talk about testing and, and assessments and wanted you to know first, what are the assessments that we're using in our district <coughs> and why we're using those assessments. And then the last and most important piece, how is that actualized in our classrooms? So when we think about the Ohio improvement process, what does that look like and how are we using the assessments, the data to inform um, the instruction. So we kind of wanted to see this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and this is how it's actualized in our in our classroom. So we know that there's um, a, a, a national agenda about uh, over testing and and over assessing kids, but we wanted to take it from a different lens and just look at what are we assessing in our district, and what is possibly we've already um, had a conversation about some things that we, we took off the list last year. Um, and moving forward, these are the assessments that we're currently using. And again, as, as I stated, um, um, how that's being actualized in our district. So we have um, Allison Bird and, and Dr. Selico that would kind of tag team it. And um, we can kind of yeah. start. Who yes, wants thank to start? you. Um, I'd like to just open with a couple of remarks. And, and Ms. Bird, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Bird. Um, but I, I don't want to regress, but I do want to echo your remarks, Dr. Dixon, about the hard work that the uh, that Mr. Schwaggard and the um, district leadership team subcommittee had put into that pilot. It's I've been involved in a, a number of pilots in my career, and this was by far, I think, one of the best I've seen. Yeah. And we stuck to our policy, and we really emphasized that, that we were going to do it the right way. And um, uh, Mr. Zucker, to address your your comment, um, and I know Ms. Pepler of concern that you've addressed as well is, you know, teacher input and buy-in. And just as a reminder, the district leadership team subcommittee is facilitated by Mr. Swaggard, but the vast majority of members are teachers. And so they were the ones who came forward with these suggestions. We listened to their recommendations and as a result went through this process. And so when you talk about buy-in, it really was a grassroots effort in terms of the teachers um, really being a catalyst for all of this change and, and Mr. Swaggard facilitating that. So I just wanna, I wanna echo, I'm, I'm really proud of, of the work that, that the team had done. So just wanna say that. And, and in addition then to tie in to what our presentation is, I, I made note as I was sitting here kind of, kind of listening to Mr. Swaggard and, and looking at, at my notes and one of the things that you see on our assessment calendar is the map assessment. And you heard from Mr. Swaggard, one of the, the ways in which we determined what, uh, what um, curriculum or what program we would purchase was based off of those map results. So that's just one example of how we use that data to show growth um, in, in, in selecting our, our, our program. So with that, um, this, is, this presentation will be a bit of a continuation, kind of an offshoot of, of many conversations in the district and in the community, as well as a previous uh, presentation that Ms. Bird and I did a while back. And it was, I believe, a request from the board to sort of follow up on assessment. And so that's what we're, we're going to do uh, for you this evening. So Ms. Bird, I'd like to turn over to you. Go ahead and get started. I'm going to begin. Um, I believe the board members received in their board packet two documents. One was an excerpt from the Ohio rules book, and then the other one was the analysis of um, House Bill 74. So I just want to speak to that. Those were added just to give you some idea of the, the current legislation that we have been following. 
Um, so the, the Ohio Statewide Assessment Program rules book was, I guess, started or used by districts and testing coordinators back in 1987 when the state first moved to establish a, a high school test. Um, so between July 1987 to now, we've gone over 28 years, and there have been 28 different legislative changes. So the, the rules book went from literally a one-pager to now a document that's over 100 pages in, in length. And, and there were periods where it went up and down. So like the first five years between 1987 and 1992, there were two legislative changes. Between 92 and 97, there were three. And we saw a huge increase between 2002 and 2007 where there were 10. And, and this latest five-year window, so starting in 2012, we are um, back on the, on the high end where we're looking at, we currently have five pieces of legislation that have, have changed the statewide testing system. There are two bills that are currently in committee and then one that the governor just signed off on. So that, that feeling that there's a lot of, of testing and there's a lot of legislation and it's, you know, in the news is, is absolutely accurate and you can tell just based on the, the current legislation. Based on some of the feedback that uh, I received from the, the last meeting, I can remember in particular Mr. Silva made, made a comment that the, the document that's on the website is a little bit hard to follow. I need to know who I need to be mad at, like where, who, who's, yeah. what's required, what's not, what are we responsible for, who do I focus my attention on. So what we've done is, is reworked the, uh, the testing calendar to just show you the different assessments that are given by grade level. So you read that vertically. So for kindergarten, you can see in green, we are required to administer the KRA. We give Dibbles, Fontis, and Pinnell, which is a, a reading assessment, and then you can see math expressions. So tests that are outlined in green, and it's a little bright and a little challenge to see here. It's a little bit darker on my screen, so I apologize for that. But those tests that are in green, we are required to do based on current, current legislation and as outlined by the rules book. Those that are uh, in red, we are required to keep and report the data, but the tool that we use is not defined. So for example, you'll see in grades one, two, and three, in kindergarten, there's dibbles. Well, that's a, a reading test, and we use it as our reading diagnostic, which we're required to report to the, to the state. But we, we, we decide to use dibbles versus um, a tool like Ames Web or um, STAR is another approved test. So the, we must report the data, but how we get it is up to us. Those are the items in red. And then the items in blue are not required, but they're the ones that are the, the most necessary and the ones that are um, closest to everyday classroom instruction. Necessary defined by? Necessary defined by educators across the board, so, so our CHUH staff. So I'll give you an example, like the math expressions. A couple of years ago, we had Kelly Stukas come and present and we adopted the new math program for the, um, for the elementary grades. That is math expressions. And so those are regular checks of the, of the units that are, are taught. So it's a direct measure for this is what the teachers were, were, were teaching, did the, the students learn it. Classroom teachers, although the, the questions are pulled from the math expressions text, teachers worked in teams to actually pull the questions to organize the, the, the design of the test and determine when they would be administered. So, so to be very um, concrete, mm -hmm. you're, you're saying that the state math diagnostic does not give us the good teaching tool and um, to, to, to be able to get rid of math expressions. Correct, it, it does not. And actually, I think we, we got ourselves in a, in, in a, in a major bind and, and caused some difficulty because in an attempt to better use the results from the math diagnostic, we asked teachers to input the student responses into our student information system and it was an, an added task the, the idea was then you can actually use the results as part of your instruction. You can see you know, what standards 
the students did well on, which ones you know they needed to focus on in terms of instruction, but it caused more problems than it, it, it did good. And so the, the diagnostics are really used, math and writing are really used to, to be compliant. And, and so again, our attempt to try to make them worthwhile just ended up making more work for the, the classroom teachers. This, again, I'm trying to just paint the picture also for people who are, are, are not sitting here. So at, at this point, what's up there, the only things that we as a district, if we, if we want to remain compliant, could get rid of would be in math expressions for those K through five. So in our, our for K through five would be math expressions, which and, and then the Terra Nova and Enview. Okay. We currently administer that in grade two, um, also in grade six, but that is our district wide grade level testing to identify for gifted. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Well, let, let me let me just piggyback on what Nancy's asking. Were you done? Yep. I, okay. Sorry about that. Um, with the, the reds that are required but not defined, uh, is there overlap? So in other words, if, if, if what's required, is, it, is each test required or is the subject matter required and therefore could you con, uh, consolidate? So the doubles is used as the reading diagnostic. It, it is part, it is it's on the approved vendor list as established by the Ohio Department of Education. So we could not they replace that with Fontes and Pinnell, which also gives us reading information. But could you put Fontes and Pinnell, it would, does Dibbles co cover what Fontes and Pinnell, or is there one that's not Dibbles nor Fontes and Pinnell? That would, that would do all both. of them, yeah. And, and throw in NWEA math, too, what the heck? <laughs> there isn't one that does, um, does all of those things in one. Yes. However, there is current legislation that's part of what's in House Bill 74, where the legislators are pushing the the department to to identify tests that do so serve multiple purposes in that way. Um, we are also investigating Ames Web as a possible replacement for Dibbles because the amount of time it takes to administer is is shorter and it can be done by smaller teams. So it doesn't necessarily have to be done by the classroom teacher. It can be be done by um, support support staff. So we're looking at ways to remedy that. But as it stands right now. For this year, we have already started and have been using the Dibble. So there's room to make adjustments in, in 15, 16. And I will say, Dr. Dixon mentioned it, when we concluded the 13, 14 school year, we did meet with elementary representatives across the grades to say, okay, what can we let go of? What can we purge? And there was extensive conversation back and forth. Well, Dobles does this, and Fontes and Pinnell provides the level. We really need to do both of them. One of the gifts um, that they came up with was not administering the, the F&P to all students, but just those who, who needed it by their definition. So just as we're, we're um, monitoring their progress, we need to give it to, to certain kids. So that was uh, a partial reduction and that came again you can even see it in the, the calendar it's as needed determined by the the teacher um, one of the other there are two other assessments that were also taken off because they are redundant so we used to give the scholastic reading inventory which provided a lexile level so that is replaced by um, NWEA map that gives us that as well and then um, we removed the SMI which is a similar test that measures math uh, performance and we just took that one off completely interesting side note we took it off of the calendar yet it is still available to teachers because even you know some found it very valuable and, and they, they still wanted to, to include it, but we didn't make it a required test. Just a couple of quick ones, I hope. Because <laughs> I, I hate, I hate with him to be interrupting you, so. No, I, I'd rather you ask the questions yeah. than me just go on. If, if we think about something like math expressions and we hear the presentation about big idea math and the other one, Carnegie. 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 Um, does, does this math is math expressions another one of these things, or it's it's the it covers the landscape of all math, or what what is this math expression? So this is these are these is this is specific to the elementary level and those specific grades. So the the 
tests given in grade two are not the same as those in grade five or the same as those in, in grade so three. It's, it's, they it's, are specific it's another, to like, everyday math or uh, it's big what idea we, math. It's what you know and what I know from when we were in school. You, you teacher taught a lesson for the week, and on Friday you had your quiz. It's comparable to the quiz or the end of unit exam or the, the chapter test. The only reason that we place it on the the calendar is to encourage and build like that consistency across buildings and so that when we sit down to review the data to look at um, possible curricular changes or instructional changes we're sure that the data is there so so that's really the only reason why it's on there four years ago you probably wouldn't have seen something like that on the testing calendar because it's just a part of the teachers regular repertoire it's part of what they what they would do anyway Okay, the other piece of it is when it says required but not defined, the tests are not defined. But there's a, a, you have to select from a set of tests. So it's defined in the sense that you can't, we can't go out and create our own and use Correct. that. Correct. Correct. So maybe it, it might have been better to say required but not that specific. Or right, something that, like that. that specific because not defined seems to say that we could create our own and we'd be okay. Well, I, you know, I like that idea. Well, then you'll really like House Bill 74 because there <laughs> well, is there's um, language in there that goes along yeah. with it. So you see a very similar thing for the secondary level, which would be grades 6 through 12, a lot more, lot more green. Um, we're currently phasing out the Ohio graduation test, but it is still in place for students who are, are the first time in grade 10, also referred to as the class of 2017. So there was this year, and only this year, a slight overlap in that some of those students were taking the OGT and taking the new state test in American history or government, depending on what course they were enrolled in. You'll see the blue, the, the PSAT. So this is the test that puts our, our students in the running for the national scholarships, so it would be national uh, achievement scholars or national merit scholars. Uh, it is a, it's something that the district pays for be because we believe it, it evens the playing field and, and provides every student with that opportunity, not just those that can afford it. Um, very similar to the, to the elementary page where you saw math expressions, you'll see midterms you know, or final exams for high school students. Again, those are teacher created. It's the closest thing to that end of the, the chapter test or the end of the, the semester test. But we place it on here just as a reminder that it, 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 it does need to, to be done. And then again, NWEA map, Mr. Swaggart already referenced it. Dr. Selico spoke about why we use it. The other benefit to using that particular test, that's like a three for one at the elementary level or in grade three. It's an alternate uh, test for the OAA, which is, uh, can help students from being retained. It is an approved uh, assessment for gifted identification in the area of mathematics and reading. And then we also use it as part of our uh, benchmarking through the Ohio improvement process that Dr. Selico will speak to. So kind of that same idea where we're trying to, to use one exam for as many purposes as we possibly can. Can we get the amount of hours that are spent on these tests? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, it's like, okay, is it one hour? Is it three hours? Is it three hours for three days? I mean, because we're always talking about classroom disruptions. In my opinion, if it's one hour once a year, that's not, not that is much of a hassle as you're spending an entire week where you're spending half a day testing. So I think that but would be valuable. They're spending so much time just preparing kids for these specific tests well, that I think yeah, I mean, that's, that's well yeah I, there's there's preparation obviously there's preparation as well but that's going to be much more I think a, a, mm -hmm. unless it's mandated by by Miramar it's going to be much more fluid based upon the, the the classroom teacher unless the hours allocated out are mandated as well if we do have a mandate on hours for preparation I'd be curious to know that as well we do not have a, a mandate or or tell buildings how much time they can or cannot right. spend on it we do push the, the notion that test prep 
doesn't benefit anybody. You're not going to properly prepare a student right. for a test by going through sample questions the day before or the week before. From a from a content perspective, right. there is benefit in in test prep, especially with the online testing and having kids log on, having um, them change the the font or the color of the the screen, and, and learning how to use certain tools. This year, with the the new state assessment assessment, they were able to use rulers and protractors and um, graphing calculators at the, the the lower grades, which was a shift for them. So there may have been some some prep to get used to the tools and the materials, but from a content perspective, uh, you know, drill and kill doesn't 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 work anymore. So we do we do speak uh, on that quite a bit. In terms of, of time, the times for the new state assessments are posted and they vary. So it varies by grade level, um, anywhere from 60 minutes up to 90 minutes. And we also found that the number of units for a test varies. For example, um, and for the performance-based assessment, the new, the new state test that was originally administered in, the, in February, there were three ELA units for all of the grades. Um, and one was 60 minutes, one was 90 minutes, one was 75 minutes. Now with the end of year assessment, there's only one e ELA unit for the tested grades. And that it varies by the grade level, but um, for the lower level, I believe it's 60 minutes. For middle school, I think it's 75 minutes, and then for the high school, I believe they're they're 80 minutes. So, with regard to the new state test, it depends it depends on the the time, you know, which version the the performance based assessment, also referred to as the PBA or the end of year assessment, uh, and the subject area because it's also different for ELA and math. Um, the the old test, the OGT and the OAA, there was a two and a half hour max on those, and those were administered once a year. You've got the PSAT that's done once a year. Um, it's a, it's a one-shot deal for the midterms and final exams. We provide the schedule. We do an alternate schedule during the day, so you know all of the students participate in the same, the same type of rotation. But in terms of the, the PBA and the EOI, those are posted on the website, and I can send it to you in a day. Yeah. Just a question, in terms of the, the tests that are reported, you only reported the tests that are required across an entire grade. So the reason why, that's, I'm specifically looking at midterm and final. There's obviously other exams that are given by teachers, but they have freedom of when they give them. This we do not report that. midterms or final exams, but there is a, a time period because it, it goes along with the the end of the semester. So our our midterm period is the last week before the semester ends. And then final exams is the... Right, but but that's why that, those are reported on this chart. I mean, because those don't fit in the same category for me. And, and I'll Correct. just throw out for a moment here. I, I realize how this prepares people for college. Uh, do, we, I guess we've talked through the educational staff and people still think midterms and finals are the best way to actually teach? Well, it's People. not connected to to teaching. It's it's your final. It's your summative assessment. It's yeah. it's yeah. over the I, course of this semester. I, I, I'm going to tell you straight out. I've never been a fan of midterms and finals. I think it's a very it's a poor way to test uh, assessment. Frankly, that's my opinion in college and high, and and any school. But that's just my personal opinion. Okay. Do we know it? So what does it mean um, that a test is required? I'll just go over that briefly. Bottom line, it means we have to report the results to the state. Then the state then uses those results to, um, to compare districts and to compare schools. So when you think about our local report card, there are six different components. Two of those measures are, are directly connected to student promotion. They are the K-3 to literacy measures, so that's where the results from the diagnostics, so the doubles in the KRA that you saw on that elementary slide, are used. And then we know it's also tied to the third grade reading guarantee, where if students haven't hit the, um, the proper scale score, that they are in danger of being retained. The second measure that's related directly to student promotion is the graduation rate. So that includes the Ohio graduation test for students in the class of 2017 and, and lower and the new state tests for the class of 2018, so current ninth graders and those who are younger, as well as credit accumulation. Then there are four measures that are, are used 
to again to, to rank or to to measure the district and school performance so those are tied to the ESEA waiver that Dr. Selico will speak to but again in a nutshell it's our performance in those four areas can lead to rewards or it can lead to additional support I just want to show you Based on current legislation, you've heard me refer to this one a couple of times, House Bill 74, because it is a big one and it is still in committee. The, this is the exact same calendar that, that I showed you for 1415. The only difference is those tests that you see in black with the line through them are those that are uh, uh, going to possibly be elimin eliminated if House Bill 74 goes through as currently written. So, so, Nancy, going back to your question about, you know, can we do anything with the, the writing diagnostic? Is there anything that we can replace it with? The state is looking back and saying that this may not be the best use of, of our instructional time. We don't necessarily need to require districts to do this. So they are going through and, t and taking it off. Allison, the, yeah. the, you said House Bill 74? Yes. And that when you say the state is saying we're recommending, so this House Bill 74 was driven by ODE? I don't know specifically who drove it, but it is it was sponsored by Representative Brenner, and it, it's it's part of state legislation. So I, I, I would hope that this is you know communication from the from the department to the state legislator but i can't say that with with certainty well the only reason i asked it that way was you said they you said the state is saying this isn't necessarily helpful and in and i assumed you meant this was somehow driven by ode because these things come from so many different directions just from from community members expressing concerns to their legislators and and from committees and so I'll, I'll look I'll look at that I was just curious and then you see um, similar changes at the secondary level again with the removal of the Ohio graduation test they're moving from biology or from physical science as the science test to biology and then possibly removing geometry but that's still up there in in green So I guess kind of tie back, Nancy, to your, to your comment. Things are coming from so many different places and people are providing feedback. I think it's important for folks to know that our participation and our performance matters. So, so there was the recently passed House Bill 7, also referred to as Safe Harbor, which does provide some, some protection. It says that, that schools and districts can't move into or, or won't be penalized with some of the existing sanctions. But it doesn't do anything for, the, for our buildings who are currently in a, a low status or, or need additional support to get them out. So when, our, when we have families, and I completely understand the rationale behind it, I just want to make sure that people know that there can be um, a, a negative impact to the, to the schools and to the, the district and even to ind individual teachers when our kids don't participate. So I would recommend the, the, the best thing to do or the, the first thing that I would recommend is going and contacting your state legislator. So there's two bills that are currently uh, in, in committee and that's House Bill 74 and then House Bill 138 take a look at them you can you can pull them off of line the analysis is, uh, the analyses are available if if deemed appropriate we can even post those on the website to make it easier for people to review them take a look at the Think language that's there yeah. and contact your your state legislator to say you know I want to see this change I want to see this removed this is not working this is having a significant impact on my child's education I haven't mentioned these pieces of legislation do you have a synopsis of them Yes, I do. I um, provided you with 74 uh, ahead of time, and then uh, 138 was just recently introduced, and I, I do have a hard copy here, but can provide that one as, as well. And then again, House Bill 7 was the one that was already approved, that's referred to as the, the safe harbor, but having gone over that one a number of times, it, it can be slightly misleading in, in, in the protection that it provides to the district and to buildings. 
we have taken steps to meet with other testing directors um, and representatives from the Ohio Department of Education to express the challenges that we face and, and make recommendations. So I'm not asking parents or families or community members to do that alone. We are also working to, to do that at the, the state level. Um, as part of the strategic planning process we've and, and pushes from, from you as board members, we've began looking at other ways to identify, you know, ourselves, looking at other indicators, so, you know, uh, fine and performing arts participation, um, our own grades, uh, our opportunities for students to take world languages K-12, to um, looking at attendance of students and adults, and Mr. Silverman kind of hinted at that with, with the professional development and the level of participation, but looking at, you know, we want this to, uh, to be a place that students want to come to school to learn and that adults want to come to, to work. So again, we're working on identifying other indicators of, of excellence. And, and I'll say this, as a, as a graduate and a uh, uh, community member and, and homeowner for, for 30 years, I just moved two years ago, I know we're a district of excellence. And I know that we're, we're a district of excellence not only in, in, the, in the indicators that we identify ourselves, but we have the, the capacity to be that in terms of our state assessments as well. So I, I, it's, to me, it's not an either or, it's a, it's a both. Um, and you know, once we get through this, this challenging time, I'm, I'm sure that we will, we'll get there. So with that, I'll hand it over can, to. Can I can yes, I ask a, a clarifying question? So so when you talked about um, House Bill Seven and Safe Harbor, yes, um, I want to make sure I understand. You're saying that that opt out or other choices that people make um, because of Safe Harbor may not harm the district overall, but in the way that safe harbor is defined, but it absolutely can harm a building right. and a teacher. So a building, for example, um, that it could kick a building into being eligible for the so the language the kind says of voucher that, ed choice vouchers. Ed choice vouchers. The for language example. says that that okay. d that schools are they can't be moved into those sanctions based on their 14, 15 scores. Okay. But what happens? But they can't be moved out. Yes. Okay. When we have students or families that opt out, that means those are tests that are, are not taken, and that's tied to our achievement component. Right. So the more students that we have that opt out, the fewer points that we earn in terms of our performance index. Right. The lower the performance index, the less likely that we move out of those sanctions, and those sanctions are in place for at least two years. So that's where it's a little, you know, on, on the surface, it's like you can't be moved into th that, that penalty phase for the 14-15 school year, but we're not concerned with that as much as we are um, not being able to to get out of it. And talk about the teacher ramifications. And the, the, the teacher, what the state has also done with the, the establishment of the new tests is added value, added reports to grades for which they didn't exist previously. So for example, they are now adding value added reports to teachers of science in grades five and eight. That wasn't in place before. We have a new test um, in social studies for grade six. They will have value added reports. So it's the same thing. Teacher works with, with children over the course of the year. They bring value. That's where we earn our A's in terms of their overall performance. When a student doesn't test, then, then that student's performance isn't included in that, in that teacher's individual calculation. So in the event that we have a, you know, the three students in a particular grade level or four students in a grade level who don't participate, then that's three or four students that, that those teachers in that grade level, um, that their growth, their advancement isn't, isn't calculated in their value added report. If, if we think about that example, <clears throat> does it matter the type, the, 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 the level of performance of the student? In other words, if you got a high performing student, I could see how that could that hurt. But what if you have a low performing student? We Does still make, we, our, our data says we still make gains. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the, the, the area that we value. do best mm -hmm. is in value added. It's but in that progress measure. But I guess the question measure. that I'm asking is, does it matter which student opts out in terms of us looking at our gains? They all count. When, when students opt out, the, the, they, we earn zero points for them. Mm -hmm. 
So whether they so score goes, limited so or they the score advanced. So the is averaged in. Yeah. Well, oh. it's it's not that it's averaged in. It's that it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, count. It, it doesn't count at all. For example, so we'd be our better off earning index, some right? points right. than earning right. none at all. You look like you have another question. I'm, I'm listening. Okay. I got several questions, <laughs> but, but I, I, I'm going to ride this one out for a minute. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll let Dr. Selico take the floor. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bird. So, so the question, you know, comes in as to what are we doing with all of these assessments and how does it play in? And, and rather than looking at things in isolation, you know, we want to show, show the relationship between assessment and curriculum and instruction, and they are very much are enmeshed. And so um, what you see here, and I know, I know it's, it's tiny, and is this the pointer one here? Okay, all right. So what I'm going to talk about is the cyclical process um, with the Ohio Improvement Process. But before I even get into that, I, I want to just say a few remarks and a reminder and just go in depth just a tiny bit further as to, um, to, to address some people's questions rather in the community or, or staff questions as to why we do the Ohio Improvement Process. And so um, since 2008, uh, Ohio has participated in the uh, U.S. Department of Education's Differentiated Accountability Initiative, so it's the acronym DA because we love acronyms. And this was in a, an effort to, to help districts manage the improvement on, in schools under the No Child Left Behind, which is now the ESEA Flexibility Waiver. But the, the Differentiated Accountability Initiative created lists identifying districts that were in need of support. So it was either high, medium, or low um, levels of support. And at one time it was based on AYP, but uh, recently it's been changed to look at the achievement gaps, the, the gap closing, looking at achievement overall, progress and graduation rates, which uh, correlate to what the, the current um, report card looks like. But they, they rank order districts. So in this, in this process, the, and Ohio participates in it, they look at the lowest 5% of the districts across the, straight, the state, and those districts are uh, deemed as needing high level of support. The next 10% would then be in the medium, in the medium uh, level of support, and then the next 20% of the districts, again working from the bottom, would then need low level of support. And then the top 65%, the remaining, are in independent status and, you know, are kind of functioning fine. The reason I point this out is because our district last year was in medium support. So again, that's that after the 5%, we're in the bottom 15%. So this year, we, based on our progress, we were able to get to low status uh, level of support. But essentially what that, that does is it still requires us to be part of the Ohio improvement process. So, so aside from the fact that we believe this is a, a good process and districts that are not mandated to participate in this process elect to, to participate because they recognize it is an effective practice. It's been deemed uh, effective in, uh, in our state, in other states. We've been a model for this process. And so... Um, we, we then have, as, as a result, again, needing to, to participate in this process, it it's, has value at many levels. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, what those levels are. And so when we look at the stages, this in nature here is the entire Ohio improvement process. So there's four stages to the process. And they're, like I said, they're cyclical in nature. And then this over here, I'm going to spend a little bit of time time, it's sort of a little subset of process of what happens within the larger context. So when we start out, and we're, again, the reason we're, we're discussing this is because we're saying, what are we doing with all these, these the data that we just saw? What, why are we using MAP? How are we using FMP, et cetera, et cetera? So the first steps that we, we took, and this will be a refresher. I, I know you've heard some of this before. But our first step was to identify our critical needs of our district. And again, this is the district leadership team, which is comprised of teachers and administrators, um, identifying those needs. And we did use district data to, to look at that. Various means, and some of it was a little subjective in the sense that you are asked to identify, you go through a number of areas, and you identify high, medium, or low level of support and what we feel the district where that is at in terms of reading, math, science, et cetera, and many other areas. So we're using data here to, to look at our critical needs in the district. Then we move to stage two, 
where then we begin to take this information that we learned in stage one and develop a focus plan moving forward. So we have the information, we know we need to now set some goals and strategies and action steps and that's what's posted online, that's our Ohio Improvement Process District Plan that, that is available for everyone to view. And so here, on a regular basis, we are, our goals focus on climate and achievement and within that climate we are looking at rate of suspension, so we're looking at data, again, to refresh our memories, the number of students being suspended as well as the subgroups of students and looking to reduce um, subsets of, of subgroups of students that are being suspended. So again, we're looking, we're pulling, extracting data to look at and to monitor our progress and we report that regularly through our uh, monthly meetings. We also use MAP to assess our progress and similar to what you saw with the um, the, the data related to our progress, uh, the, the increases with the pilot, it's a similar process and we, we look at the different levels, uh, our, our growth throughout the year and we have, we use those three benchmarks to benchmark our, pro to look at our progress throughout the year to see are we on track to reach our goal, which ultimately is getting that B on the report card. Um, so after stage three then in the process, we move down here and this is where the bulk and where the rubber hits the road. This is where the work happens. And I will tell you, the people involved in this process are not us sitting here, it's the teachers. And so during this stage, which is um, the implementing and monitoring of our plan, within that comes this five-step process. So we've heard this term before, and or otherwise known as our teacher-based teams. These are the teacher-based teams now doing this work. So there are five steps that take place and um, in, the, the catalyst for this whole process is related to data. We need to take, we need to assess our students to see their levels, where they're at, in order to then drive our next four steps with our, with our students. So step one, which you can barely see here, you can't see probably, is collect and chart data. So that's the first step. So when our teachers are meeting weekly at their collaboration meetings, they are looking at data. So what, is, what data are they looking at? It can be one of the items that you saw on the list, F and P, certainly math expressions. It can be uh, map data. It can be any one of those tools. But the most effective tools to use are, when Ms. Bird mentioned, the math expression tests, the ones that are closest to the teachers, that are designed by the teachers, created by the teachers. Um, and, and, and so those are the ones that are typically used. Uh, and those are, one example would be the math expressions. So when we look at step one, mm -hmm. we're, we're down to the individual student now, is that correct? We are looking at all students. So just to give you a real brief example, we would administer a test to a group of students and then we would break it down to see which students are, who mastered it and who didn't master it. So you are looking at groups of kids, but within those subsets, you're looking at, at individual students and then you design your instruction. So then we head into, you know, we start to get into these second steps, which one, so we're collecting the data here, and step two, we're analyzing it. Step three, again, this is, of the five steps, this is the most crucial. What happens here is what we do with the data. So um, we then start to implement our strategies, um, and, and we're, looking at, we're looking at shared expectations. So the teachers sit together. They look at their data, and they say, okay, what are we going to do for this group of students who weren't proficient in this standard? What are we going to do for the students who did master it? So, and then we, then that's where our differentiation takes place. And this looks different at different schools. In, the, in observing the different TBTs at different buildings, you have flexible grouping then. You can do that within your classroom. You can do that. I can share that if Ms. Bird is my teaching partner. We can blend kids based on what we've learned in steps one and two for their skill set. So that's, that's the big step. And then what happens there is that we have to monitor. So then, we're, we're making sure that teachers are using the best practices and, and holding one another accountable. And then we're going to implement those changes in step four consistently. And that's, that's where the monitoring has to come in, as I mentioned. And then finally, we collect, chart, and analyze our data. Now step five is one that's often hard to get to because you're tied up in, in steps one through four. But ultimately, this can result in, um, there are some schools, and, and I encourage this, data walls that you take what you've learned and you post it and you're looking and it's a visual representation. So if I see a, a child who's back here, who should be here on the chart, I can look at that child and I see his, his or her name and say, okay, what are we going to do for that child? And so those are means of ways to post your data and chart it, analyze it, and then strategize, you know, what are we going to do with these kids who, are being, who, are, who may be falling behind?
Andrea, can yes, I interrupt? So, so go back to step three for a minute and mm -hmm. tell and help me understand. I understand. I, I I hear that it's different building by building, but how often would a TBT um, take that step to say what are what are we going to do about this? I mean, is that is that I, I might have missed that if you said it. Is that yeah. weekly? Is that monthly? How often are they are they saying here here's what we have, here's how we've analyzed it, and here's what we're going to do about it? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, and and teachers have asked this question, and there's been some some um, some question as to trying to put it into a box and saying, okay, well every three weeks you're going to complete a form, or you're going to, and there's really no set time limit that you that can define this. Okay. So. TBTs do meet weekly, but that may mean that they spend the first week just on s steps one, two, and three. And then what generally happens in step three is we would agree that let's say after assessing we learned that comprehension is an issue. Our students across the board at our grade level were struggling in comprehension. We may then say, let's try this strategy, whatever it may be in regards to comprehension. But we know in a week's time, by the time we meet next week, that's not enough time to, to right, right, assess right. the growth. Yeah. So we may let it go for three, four weeks. And in the meantime, we're, we're utilizing that strategy, and then the team would agree. This is all team-driven. They decide. They, that's why it's different every building, because they have the autonomy to, to, to choose their practices and their timelines. So then they may say in four weeks, we're going to revisit this goal. And then they would have done maybe a post-assessment, come back. Okay, now where are our kids are after we, we, had, we tried this strategy? And then I think key here is those are formative assessments too. Mm -hmm. So, so those, you know, so when we go back to talk about those standardized tests, we're in no way saying that we're supporting those tests that are mandated by the state. We're saying that this is a better way to inform our instruction. And when we go back to hold those, you know, the principles that unite us in that document that talked about assessments that inform our instructions are the assessments that we want teachers to really use. This process, I think, highlights that because teachers are having an ongoing conversation about those tests that they made and making sure that it's close to the curriculum that they're pushing and teaching. And, and we think this is the most meaningful. And that's why I believe so many districts still use this process even when they don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry, you can continue. No, no, that's fine. That's good. And um, so, yes, we, we um, the, the common form of assessments that we refer to regularly are those that are generally teacher created. The other advantage, and one of the things that we need to explore as we look at our ELA, um, which will be probably the next adoption you're going to hear about, but one of the things that makes math expressions nice is that um, it has built in assessments. And teachers generally are satisfied with them. Whereas ELA, we struggle a bit because we don't have a program, a defined program that has built in assessments. So teachers are struggling to create those. And I think those are the most effective types, teacher created and, and administered, um, as opposed to the summative and, um, assessments that were, were required. Th those generally make their way to TBTs, um, you know, the writing diagnostics, th things that Ms. Bird had mentioned. So. To do away with those, we, we, would be, we would be thrilled to do away with some of those state assessments because we don't feel they're nearly as beneficial as what teachers create and what they own. Right. Um, and then finally, then we head into um, over here, which is you know, the final stage of the Ohio Improvement Process, and that's gathering evidence and the imp implementation and looking at the impact. And so you're evaluating, you're basically evaluating the process, and then you start all over again. So for us at the end of this year, for example, we will meet, we will discuss our struggles this year. We will uh, redefine the process if need be, make revisions to the different forms that guide our, our process, um, review the evidence, and see how we proceed. So just quickly in closing, um, we, you know, at all levels we are, we are using data. So at teacher-based teams, I, I spoke at length about what we are using, the different, um, the different assessments. And then at the building leadership level, again, that's a, a level we haven't spoken really about, but I, I have in front of me a data calendar that Ms. Bird has created, and it's in color, and it's usually very pretty, but I have the black and white version. But each month, we have it defined. August, we will look at OAA and OGT, for example, and climate data. In September, the BLTs will look at 
um, well, actually, that was September. In October, the TBT and BLT rubrics, which then are also an adult assessment. So we give surveys to our adults to assess how they're doing on that five-step process. And there, it's established, you know, with a rubric, and, and we assess it then. And then in November, it's FNP and MAP, et cetera, et cetera. So we have data every month where the building uh, leadership teams are using, and they're also then using a similar very closely aligned process as the teacher-based teams are. And then at the district level, again, as I stated, we're using MAP and various climate, pieces of climate data to assess the district as a whole. I think an important so, piece mm -hmm. that I want you to leave out is the feedback that you provide. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You mm -hmm. know, because you're, fi you know, yeah. because they're doing the work, but the district, your, your team is providing feedback yeah. to the buildings on how well the process, is. I mean, so you could talk okay. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, um, so we have the, the built-in um, feedback system, whereas the teacher-based teams, there's, there's a form that they complete, which is the one little piece that I know teachers were, were trying to work through to move away from compliance and to really see the value in the process. But at the end, it says questions, concerns, needs from the, the BLT and the DLT. So those get passed to the BLT, and the BLT pass them on to the district leadership team. And then we have a process that every month we respond back to the teachers who had those questions. Yeah. And then in addition to that, we also are assessing how at the BLT level, the BLTs assess how the TBTs are doing through, again, the process. And they provide feedback saying, mm, what did you mean in step one? You probably can elaborate a little more, or, you know, feedback such as that. Then at the district leadership team, we take an hour each month to then evaluate how the BLTs are providing feedback to the TLTs and TBTs. And every district has been, has, or every level, you know, we provide training on how to do that. And um, so it's a system. And again, it's cyclical in, in nature, and it, we get back to the... But it shows buy-in within the system about what we believe is important. And it's these, ins these assessments is informing how our students are doing and providing feedback to one another. I think that's... that's and holding key. everyone accountable throughout the process all, at all levels. Yeah. Uh, how does this... If we think about the OIP, we go through the cycle, that's basically a year of work, right? Or... Something well, it'll continue into year. next year, but well, yeah. Well, that's the question yeah. that I have, mm -hmm. is how does it continue in the next year? Because you've got this set of teachers working with a certain set of students, but they're not going to have these students next year. So how do we go back to the green, the aqua, and um, pass that data on? Or, you know, how, where's the handoff? That's a good question. Yeah, did you want to address that? Are you rethinking you of Infinite Campus or, yeah, uh, yeah, or? Uh, from a from a technical standpoint, it's one of the reasons why we use um, our student information system, which is Infinite Campus, and why we use Thinkgate. Okay. So, so the the results and the information that's gathered is stored in that system. So as the students move on, it stays with them, so their current teachers can refer back to it. So that's just from, from a technical piece. So, that so it, is the analysis at the level of a group of students even going mm -hmm. into the next year, or is it individual students and then the teachers have to get together and then try to figure out how, you know, what they have? You know what I'm saying? Do they have, do they have a sense of when we pass it to the next grade, are we passing groups of students? Are we passing individual students that then we then have to go through a, some kind of process to figure out how we're going to teach them? So the classroom roster, the question is, yeah, are we, are we following the kids in a cluster in the roster in their results? Right. Mm -hmm. No, I think this process, so it, right, but I, it's a good question, but I, I think this process is built more for when you go back and see what are the critical needs of the school and the district. So you're ad identifying those overarching goals, and you're trying to close those gaps by having those conversations each year. So, for example, year mm -hmm. one for yeah. a building, it may be math. Uh, well, this year we had a climate goal. Math to and reading. And mm -hmm. math and reading. So we had a percentage mm -hmm. that we wanted to close those, th those gaps. So we may meet that, hopefully. But then <laughs> we may increase it, or de you, know, you know what I mean, or come up with another goal. So... I think that the overarching is how are we are identifying our critical needs from the district and our school base and how are we consistently monitoring it and having those conversations and even when you achieve that goal you know that the next year there's going to be a, a new goal so for each student 
I'm not sure if we have that. I don't know if this process works for individual students, the cohorts. That's a very good question, but I'm not sure if that. Yeah, I know what he's asking. Do you have yeah, an answer for that? Yeah, I don't know if this process there, works for that. So individual students' results will still be maintained. The mm -hmm. teachers don't have to go through the old forms, but what happens is when they get their new class rosters, um, and as in its simplest form, the system will, will reshuffle them. So, so they will have that old information, but organized based on the new grouping. So you're not transferring class A is gonna be the exact same class of, of third graders that it is in fourth graders. Those kids will be mixed up, but the information will be reworked so that the classroom teacher isn't starting from scratch. Is that more in line like with mm -hmm. your with your question? Yeah. In terms of the uh, the climate indicators, are those mandated by OIP or do we pick the indicators? No, we can actually pick the goals. We can pick the areas. For example, some districts might have a science goal. And we have a, a need in science. We just it, through this process you really have to prioritize cuz more any more than 3 goals, you know, we all know about choosing too many goals that nothing really gets accomplished so but, but so for instance when you mentioned a climate indicator you mentioned a, a, what I would consider a negative indicator I mean a positive result from a negative indicator in terms of fewer detentions or suspensions or whatever else do, are, do we use positive indicators as well that, that we can think of in terms of climate school climate well where you see I think the positive spin on things are where the action steps are and the strategies because that's there that's then where the, the the student summit came in and the positive behavior supports and so we're, we're strategizing in a positive light to address that kind of negative goal yeah but, but we try I'm, I'm not coming up with great ideas here but I mean <laughs> uh, just the fact that students want to be in a building if there's a way to measure that they want to come to school um, that might be an interesting thing to brainstorm if there's a way to accurately measure it you know just attendance yeah. is not a good measurement of that but, but yeah maybe. and one of our action steps uh, dr. Johnston has proposed something to me he, he shared with our actually our leadership team and and I think started with me but just sharing with me this this great survey that's out there by an independent company and I don't recall off the top of my head who that is but it's it addresses all those climate issues and I think it hits parents and yeah, sure come on up and as he's coming up, I'll say one of the reasons I bring it up is it relates to something that one of you said earlier, which is, you know, when you talk about elevating the 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 uh, importance of the arts and and some of the non three R's, which were never three R's, um, the that may be a good indicator. You may see real advances in school climate from that. So. Really go. good. The organization that <clears throat> Dr. Selico is mentioning is called National School Climate uh, Center, and We've done this work in the past where we've uh, surveyed students and surveyed families and surveyed staff. Um, this organization is a, has a, um, a working knowledge of and uh, partnerships with states around positive behavior supports, which is what our approach is. So one of our action steps that we'll be working on um, actually in the spring of this year is that engagement of students, staff, and um, community members. Because that gives us a sense of, and the questions are, you know, when I go to school, do I feel safe? When I go to school, do I feel welcome? Is there a care any of those kinds of things? So it's one way to get at that, and so that's part of the plan. I think that's great. I, I just, I guess I'm, I, my head keeps going to, I, I would love to hear that climate isn't just about behavior. Um, right. That climate is, what is it that inspires you to come? To, right. to, to be a part of that community, to be a part of the learning environment. And, I, and again, I'm not coming up with brilliant ideas of how to right. do that, but I just would right. suggest that. Is that, is that it? Mm -hmm. That's Thank it. you. We, yeah. we rest. <laughs> <laughs> Probably literally and rest. figuratively. I think. Rest. <laughs> I, I think if you did, if you had much more to say, we'd all be resting. You know, yeah, right. just right. Right. Okay. tired tonight. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> but that was very, very helpful for me. I know. Thank you. Kim. So thank, thank you. you. And I would. Um, urge you to work with Angie on getting uh, um, what you prepared for tonight onto the website, maybe on some, you know, I know this is asking a lot, but maybe on some special page around testing um, and, and include the information about the different pieces of legislation and 
I would really like to, to have that in, in one. Okay. We actually discussed that. We anticipated perhaps that. <laughs> oh, well, then. <laughs> we, were, we, were ready. we were ready for that. We're getting to know our, our board and our community well, very well. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's it. Okay. Right. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. There you go. Mr. Gaynor. Ms. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. <coughs> Mr. Silverman. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yeah, I can hear. Yes. <laughs>